All right. Hello, everyone. Good evening. Thanks for coming. Um, I know everyone's probably webinared out by now, uh, and we really appreciate you joining us. Uh, I promise you we've saved the best for last. Um, so today we have the pleasure of having Graham on board, and Graham and his course on nutrition farming is really what inspired my dad and I to change the way we farm and our outlook on food production because yes as grain farmers we are producing food whether it be for animals or for humans and we have a huge effect on the global population's health and on the environmental uh, and on the environment. Um, the great part about Graham is that he's also amazing at giving farmers practical tips that make us more efficient and give us more profitability long term. So I just want to let everyone know that basically Graham would be going through his presentation for the first hour and a half. And then at the end, we're going to have a Q&A question. So throughout the presentation, please type your questions into the Q&A box. And then I'll be summarizing them towards the end. Um, and without further ado, I'll let Graham go ahead and give us his magic. <laughs> Thank you, Alex. Yeah, great pleasure to be here. I'm, I'm grateful that um, some of you have turned up to listen. I thought you'd be out sunbathing with 14 degrees outside. It's a bit of a shock to hear you've got that kind of warmth this early. But um, yeah, I've, I've had a year of normally doing, previously pre-COVID, doing 25, 30 countries a year teaching. And it's been a strange year to be sidelined and just be doing Zoom meetings and so forth. I had my first week of seminars last week in Western Australia, and it was just so nice to be out teaching again. So, yeah, we better get started because, you know, if you know anything about my talks, you'll know it's often referred to as drinking from the fire hose. And what you're going to get in this short 90 minutes is a lot of information. So hopefully, um, hopefully you can retain it and perhaps we'll make the notes available so that you've got, uh, you've got some reference to go back to. So we'll begin with, you know, I was given sort of a series of things that might be of interest to you. So we're going to talk through those things. And of course, you're more than welcome to uh, send in any questions at all. And we'll answer those questions at the end. But what we've found with our work globally with Broadacre, and of course, we do a tremendous amount in Australia. And we have a lot of experience with, with dry land conditions because that's what we've got. You know, you get you perhaps one in three crops come in uh, in the last few years with the droughts that we've had. So we've needed to develop strategies relative to dry conditions. And I'll share some of those things and some of the things to be wary of relative to, because you guys may well be coming up with a dry year with the snow uh, already melting at this early stage. So for example, we work with a group called Victorian No-Till, which are about a million acres between them. And they've completely adopted this nutrition farming kind of strategy. And it's been this tremendous success story for them. They've been out yielding everyone. There's been lots of stories covering their story, but their fungicide rigs have become foliar rigs. And it's very much part of this nutrition farming, this concept of getting back, taking care of the nutrition, understanding that nutrition is the root cause in many cases of a lot of your problems. And so getting in and addressing those things very efficiently, because the thing to understand is that foliar fertilizing is to 10 to 15 times more efficient than soil-based applications, particularly for trace minerals, but for minerals like potassium, which we'll talk about later, the first mineral that you're going to have, you're going to struggle with in dry conditions is the second most abundant and most min, most mobile of all minerals, potassium. It's only taken up through soil solution. There is no soil solution in dry conditions, and you need to be foliar spraying potassium, and we'll talk about the best way to do that later. What we see is that small inputs can produce big results at low cost because of that increased efficiency. And that more rapid response, that fast tracking of greening the plant, of building chlorophyll density, uh, has a flow on effect for soil life because, of course, the plant is pumping uh, half of its sugars, half of its glucose it produces through photosynthesis, it pumps down to the roots, and 60% of that half, which is 30% of its total production, it gives away, it gifts to the army of soil organisms beneath its feet or beneath its roots. And of course, they give back, they fix nitrogen, they solubilize phosphorus, they protect from disease. There's a microbe behind every mineral and so forth. So, so foliar fertilizing has much more impact than many people recognize. It was basically used in intensive horticulture as a problem solver and yield booster, but now pasture broadacre, globally, there's a recognition 
of the value of this particular strategy. So just quickly covering seven reasons to foliar spray. Uh, number one is to rapidly increase deficiencies, um, which is pretty important in a short cycle crop to, to get in there and change and green up that plant and get rid of that chlorosis, those power colors, those blotches, those stripes that are reducing your production of the building block of your profit, which of course is glucose. That's what the plant uses to build everything. You don't want those blotches and power colors and stripes, and you can fast track that correction with a foliar spray to relieve crop stress. And as, as I mentioned, in our drought conditions, I've spent the last every weekend for the most of this last few months at my large apple farm in with all the energy I had not traveling, I decided to invest in a third research farm in quite a large apple well. Well, it's 18,000 trees. It's a reasonable sized apple farm, um, but we're in the midst of a drought. So I've had to use all of my tricks relative to relieving crop stress specific to drought. And there's a few things I can share relative to that, but uh, things like transplant stress, drought, frost, heat, waterlogging, pest pressure, all of those can be counted with specific inputs that uh, what we call rescue remedies. And the biggest and most important of those is just simple seaweed. Kelp is filled with the four hormones that are so helpful relative to relieving crop stress. There's often times when you look at a soil test, you look at a leaf test and there's a, they're quite different and you think, why? Well, why don't they mirror each other? That's relative to the fact that no mineral is an island. Every mineral impacts one, two, or in the case of calcium, seven other minerals. And if you've overdone something, then there's an antagonistic impact on several other minerals or at least one other mineral. And so in, in a high phosphorus situation, really you can't just put zinc in the soil because phosphorus just locks it up and that's where you bypass the soil-based issue and you foliar spray zinc and that's much, much more efficiently, uh, much, much more efficient. So uh, number four is just to boost yield. And of course we can do that very efficiently with the use of plant growth promotants like Tricontinol, which is a wonderful input, it's a wonderful low cost input. Look, I can't really think of um, anything much more productive at that investment in terms of what's called a cost to benefit ratio, tricontinental has got to be number one. But even the, even the natural hormones, or if you're fully spraying urea to boost nitrogen or potassium or whatever, it's a quick way to get a response. Uh, to improve crop quality and, and associated resilience, to spring the crop from vegetative to reproductive, which may not be so applicable for you, but certainly in our orchard scenarios, it's a big story. If you can be first in with a crop, that can be worth those first two weeks can actually be worth more than the rest of the season and to build nutrient density and protein levels and pasture and, and again we'll talk about that relative to nitrogen a little later so a few little tricks i mean basically most of you should know now hopefully and if you don't then it's time to start learning but really uh, someone made the statement one of the american consultants at one point that the best fertilizer of all is the farmer's footsteps in the field and that's uh, that applies to digging up the roots and checking that you're, you've got good nodulation on, on legumes, for example, pinching that nodule and seeing if it's pink. If it's not pink, you're not fixing nitrogen, so you sort of miss the point a little. But understanding every stripe, every blotch, every pale colour relative in your crop to the deficiency that it refers to, uh, and you need to get out there and get familiar. And you, you, you do a leaf test, you see you've got a manganese deficient, deficiency, you go out and photograph what that looks like on your crop, and now you've got a record and you start to build up an understanding where, where hopefully you get to a point where you don't even need you don't even need a leaf test to be able to see immediately what's happening. So, you know, you're looking at stem strength, you're looking at leaf size and thickness, you're looking at root health and the evidence of microbial activity are all kind of evidence of that. Uh, but you're trying to get to a point where you can see what's happening um, as rapidly as possible through that visual monitoring. monitoring. Um, one of the essence, one of the keys to the concept of nutrition farming is this concept of in-field monitoring. And we like to use a few meters, particularly nitrogen potassium meters. And probably the most important is that simple little sawn off telescope called a refractometer. And if you're not familiar, I'm sure most of you are now, because it's, it's pretty much a, a standard tool for most regenerative agriculture people. Um, and, and we are really in the midst of something of a revolution, the interest in this approach globally. Now, in some countries like South Africa, who are probably leading the, the chase, um, you know, you're pretty much a wanker. I don't know if you know the term wanker, but it's a popular term in Australia here. But you're kind of a wanker in the industry now if you're not doing something regenerative. It's like, what's wrong with you? You know, uh, get on board or you're going to miss out. It's kind of got to that point. So it's quite a change that's happened in the last five to 10 years. So... 
uh, let's talk about you know nitrogen meters for example it's just a straightforward what you're looking for with this most abundant mineral and this very important mineral called nitrogen is that you want the sweet spot for your crop now that sweet spot on a nitrogen meter is going to be much higher during the vegetative stage when this most abundant mineral is most required and then that needs to fall back from flowering onwards and now potassium becomes the emphasis but you know you need to find out in your scenario and your soils and your conditions where that sweet spot is and if you're monitoring with leaf analysis and a couple of these other tools then and then you're monitoring nitrogen as well you can see you can see visually you can see with your leaf test where is that spot where everything's doing best uh, at different stages of the crop cycle and that's your sweet spot that you aim for with that nitrogen you don't want to overdo nitrogen because we because it's a hell of a price to pay the first thing you shut down is potassium and second is calcium and third is boron and those three minerals are three of the top five minerals linked to disease pressure so you kind of shot yourself on both feet and started on your knees at that point when you overdo nitrogen so it's really important to monitor it and a, a meter allows you to do that probably the most valuable meter on the farm in my opinion certainly i couldn't farm uh, fruit crops i mean i do lots of different farming but this is just talking about the apples but um the potassium meter basically potassium is the most mobile mineral it's even more mobile minerals vary in their mobile and their mobility so there are minerals that whip straight into and around the plant very easily easily and that's npk um, and, and and magnesium and a couple of others and then there are min minerals like calcium that are just the most sluggish of all minerals and really hard to get them into the plant really hard to get them circulating and pumping into the seeds and so forth and that's where foliar spraying calcium because of its poor mobility is pretty much an essential in all crops really realistically in your scenario if you're not organic then just calcium nitrate, a couple of kilos per hectare, a couple of pound per acre is the kind of figure we're talking, with some fulvic acid to create a collated calcium fulvate, absolutely essential for every crop. If, you just, if you're monitoring relief analysis, you're chasing luxury levels of calcium uh, to, to maximise yield, and people just haven't got it because of the poor mobility and because you're often impacting calcium uptake with nitrogen or sometimes too much potassium or magnesium both of which impact calcium uptake so it's just just countering that and that's what nutrition farming is about countering it's okay most leaf tests we look at globally need more calcium let's go and put some calcium in super efficiently via the leaf with foliar fertilizing so the trick with the potassium meter and you can see what they look like in that bottom corner of the slide there uh, you're squeezing with a reef with you squeezing usually with just a garlic crusher uh, the you take the first fully developed leaf of your crop and you're squeezing a few drops of juice, three drops is all that's required, and you drop them into that little well of the meter. And basically you take three drops from the first fully developed leaf, usually the fourth leaf down, third or fourth leaf down, uh, and then you wash it gently with a tissue, clean the, clean the, the sensor, and then you take the lower leaf of the plant, um, and you can see on the left-hand side, I don't know if it's your left-hand side, but on my left-hand side of that slide uh, is classic potassium deficiency. Uh, as you can see with that burnt outer edge uh, on the lower leaves because that's the story with potassium. Now the story with potassium is so mobile that it rushes to where it's needed for growing tips, for sizing seed and so forth. And so the first deficiency sim symptoms are on those lower leaves as you can see there. And so what you want to do is make sure that you're never out of potassium and monitoring potassium from that first leaf, that first fully developed leaf is not a re reliable guideline as to your potassium status in the field. So what you're doing is taking top leaf, bottom leaf, and they need to be exactly the same. And the moment you're 10% lower, you might be, you know, might be 1,000 in the top leaf and you're 850 in the bottom leaf, that's a symptom of potassium deficiency and you need to come in. And usually with a simple foliar spray, I'll talk hectares and you just can basically call it pounds per acre because it's roughly that, it's not quite, but... Um, we use eight kilos of potassium sulfate per hectare with some fulvic acid as a foliar, you know, and we're only using small amounts, maybe a hundred liters of water, uh, and that works really well and delivers a bit of sulfur to build protein at the same time. So that's, that's a simple and expensive kind of strategy. Eight pounds, maybe nine pounds per acre is the kind of rates that we'd use in that context. So top leaf, bottom leaf, always the same as what you're aiming for. And you'll see the change from flowering onwards when there's a huge potassium drawdown, you'll see the lower leaves because the plant needs it at the top and it's sucking it from the bottom. And you've got a deficiency that you need to address right now because potassium 
is the money mineral. Potassium is what governs the weight, the size of the crop, the size of the grain, the size of the fruit, whatever you're growing. Uh, and it's huge. And people, if you're not monitoring it, uh, you're really going to you're gonna pay the price at the end of the season. And if you've been out of potassium because of that sucking from the lower leaf uh, for you know three or four weeks, you can't actually play catch up. Well, you can. You can catch up some of it, but you've always lost yield. You've always lost some of your yield potential at that point. So we mentioned the refractometer and you're looking at what you're looking at those two blue and yellow circles are what you what you see through the eyepiece of the refractometer and it looks like an old school fuel tank and essentially it is what you're looking at uh, on the low bricks you can see the bricks there with the very sharp differentiation between the two half hemispheres the blue and yellow and we can see the bricks at about perhaps four there uh, and that's an empty fuel tank. That's really a plant with, which is really lacking nutrition. It's, you're measuring dissolved solids. The light is refracting through the dissolved solids in that plant sap. And you're measuring how good you are as a grower, basically. You're measuring chlorophyll density. And you're not doing too good uh, when your bricks is only four. You should be 12 or higher for most cereal crops, cereal and legume crops, and the higher the better. But you can also use that refractometer as a guideline to your calcium status. And what you never want to see is that sharp distinction on the low bricks and the low bricks is relative to calcium, the trucker of all minerals, not being present and not delivering the seven minerals that it delivers into the plant. Uh, and you can see there that low bricks level with that sharp differentiation. What we're chasing is the good calcium uh, on the right hand side of my screen anyway, where the bricks is up at that, that kind of 12, 13 level. And it's a blurry, blurry, indistinct line. And that's good calcium. And that's what you're seeking on your refractometer every time you use it. Now, boron is huge. Uh, and so uh, if, you, if any of you are watching or listening, sorry, to my podcast, the new one that comes out tomorrow focuses on boron. And I want you to recognize the importance of this, this, this trace mineral so often neglected in Broadacre but understanding what price you're paying for that neglect on, on multiple levels, uh, including early root growth, which is going to be missing because you haven't got the cell elongation potential without boron present. It's so important for cell division, for cell strength, for what's called membrane integrity. And I'll talk, you, you can have a listen to the podcast and understand how important, but you can monitor your boron with a refractometer because you take your bricks level last thing in the afternoon and you recheck your bricks level first thing in the morning. And there should always be a difference because the plant begins at about five o'clock in the afternoon, pumping half of its sugars down to the roots to feed the roots. And then of course, to give some of that away to the microorganisms. So sugar is part of what you're measuring with bricks level. So always there should be lower levels of bricks. Uh, you, you know, your 12 becomes 10 or nine in the morning, for example. Uh, and if they're the same, you're 12 in the afternoon, 12, and the, then you're, you've got a problem because you've got a constipated plant. You've got a plant where the sugars are literally trapped in the leaf. And that's relative to this kind of trapdoor effect where at five o'clock, a little trapdoor opens and the sugars are moved around the plant and some of them are moved down to the roots. And that's controlled that trapdoor by boron. And what you're picking up, if you've got the same level in the afternoon, as what you've got in the morning is a boron deficient and you need to come in now and fix that because you stop feeding your soil life. So they stop fixing nitrogen and solubilizing phosphorus and delivering every mineral and whole range of biochemicals that protect the plant. All of that crunches to a halt because you neglected your boron, but you'll see a much bigger story of boron if you listen to the, the latest podcast. So other things you can pick up with your refractometer, it can pick up nutrient imbalances. So what you're doing in this instance with the refractometer is checking all over the plant. First top leaf, halfway down, bottom leaf, and ideally they all need to be the same bricks. And if, they're, if there's quite a variation between different sites on the plant, you've got some kind of imbalance happening there that you need to investigate with a leaf test and find out just what's happening. But it's a good little indicator that there's a problem. Uh, you can check what foliars work and what don't. You say, okay, well, I reckon I probably could do with whatever as a foliar, a couple of trace minerals or say, say some calcium or whatever, and you can verify your intuition if that's what you're using um, by basically checking how good a bricks level increased. A couple of days later, usually, you'll see if it's the right input, you'll see the significant increase in dissolved solids and chlorophyll density relative to that choice of foliar. So you can check which is best and what works better and you'll find the NutriTech products work best every time. <laughs> I'm, I'm joking, just doing a little bit of advertising here. Um, but, but I did develop them relative to bricks, so I sort of know they do work well on that front. Um, 
assessing likely weed pressure. So what you're going to do is, is measure the, with a refractometer, measure the bricks of your principal weed and then measure your crop. And always your crops would be much higher bricks than the weed. And if the weed's higher than the crop, then you've got an imbalance in your soil because weeds are invariably a signpost of an imbalance and there's too much of something that's feeding up that weed. And that's, so that checking the weed is a good sort of indicator of that. So leaf test, as we said, basically is taking that first fully developed leaf, often the third or fourth leaf, you can see there on that, on that peach tree or whatever that tree is there, uh, that the first leaf is going to be the first fully developed leaf. That's what you're going to take. And the timing for leaf testing is if, you, if, you, if you're only going to do one leaf test in a season, which is probably what you will do in Broadacre, I would do two, but if you're only going to do one, then before flowering, you've reached the business end of the season. This is when you're going to make your money and you need to know that everything's right. And not doing that. I mean, leaf testing is just saying, what do you want, plant? Oh, that's what you want. Okay, here it is. You're usually bypassing the soil and putting it straight into the leaf. And it's just such a basic essential in growing any crop that I struggle. It's like driving down the highway with a blindfold on. I struggle to see how people can even manage uh, just guessing at that critical time. It can make such a difference. It's it's, it's, it's ridiculous and it's almost ridiculous not to do a leaf test before flowering on any commercial crop because it really tells you if you're set up for the important end of the season. So one of the things we look at on a leaf test uh, is this concept that originally came from the American consultant um, Gary Zimmer. We've sort of researched it and we've driven it. So many, many agronomists now around the world now understand what I've coined the term the big four. And that's this understanding that on the leaf test, when you get your leaf test results back, you want to see four minerals, and I'll show you a leaf test in a moment and explain what I mean, but four minerals need to be at what I call luxury levels, and I'll explain what that is. But the four minerals are interesting because you might think that potassium and nitrogen, for example, should be in there, but the four minerals are the four most important minerals for the most important process. And the most important process is called photosynthesis. So what are those four minerals? Calcium, magnesium, phosphorus, and the big surprise package is what my next podcast is about, the trace mineral boron. So calcium, magnesium, phosphorus and boron on your leaf test need to be at luxury levels and then you can stand back and count the cash almost. I mean, it is such a, makes such a difference to productivity, profitability, uh, pest and disease pressure and so forth if you can get this right. And the sad part of that story is we work in 59 countries with teams of agronomists in each of those countries and 80% sorry, 30% of all the leaf tests we analysed, all four of those minerals aren't even in the acceptable range, let alone the top end of the acceptable range. All four of those trace minerals are deficient and you're not having fun at that point. You're not going to be enjoying farming if you've got the four most important minerals for the most important process all deficient. You're going to have every pest and his dog turn up to party and you're thinking, God, does life have to be this stressful? It does if you don't understand. That's why knowledge is your empowerment and the, rege the regenerative model to understand these things makes life a lot easier. So if we look here at a leaf test and we're just looking at ryegrass, for example, and understand that every, every plant has different ideal requirements for dry leaf analysis. So you can't say, oh, this is the range for, for my wheat crop because it's not, but this is a ryegrass sample and we have, you know, we can give you the ranges for all of those crops if you haven't got them available. But we can see here, well, let's look at the big four. Let's look at phosphorus. Uh, it's 0.15%. And what we're chasing, see the acceptable range for phosphorus, if you look at that chart, is 0.2 to 0.5. And a luxury level is 0.5 or 0.49. We want to see that blue bar up on the top end of acceptable, just short of the excessive range. So we want it at 0.49, for example, or 0.5, which would be right on the line. That's phosphorus. That's a luxury level of phosphorus. And then we look at calcium, the second of the big four, and we can see 0.2 to 0.6 is where we need to be. This person's only 0.11, so they're really they're five times less calcium than what they should ideally have in that crop. Um, yeah, it's about five times, five and a bit. Uh, and so 0.59 is where we want, or 0.6, we went right up on that line, the excessive line within those boxes. That's a luxury level of calcium. Then we look at magnesium, 0.16 to 0.14. He's only got 0.14 and we want 0.4. So yeah, again, it's three times uh, more, more magnesium is required. And so magnesium needs to be on that line. And finally, boron, we want 15 parts per million and he's only got three. So he's five times short again. Almost everything's five times, uh, you know, it's only 20% of what it should be. And that's going to be a serious issue 
you're not having fun farming that ryegrass, I promise you. And that's because you didn't know. Now you do know, so do something about it. It can be a game changer. Just understanding the simple factor can be a game changer in your production. So uh, let's look at a few strategies to, if you're going to get into doing some of this foliar spraying, you know, to convert your fungicide rig and start foliar spraying some things that are required and watch how much less fungicide you're going to need. Um, a few concepts, collation, uh, microbial support, pH factors, a few other things. We'll, we'll just go through some of them quickly. Um, collation, basically, well, the word collation or chelate, you might say chelate, but it's actually pronounced chelate for some reason, um, means claw, you know, the word claw in Greek. Uh, and that's kind of what happens. You could look at your crop and say, yeah, because you're familiar with your crop and say, yeah, I've got a zinc deficiency there. So let's put out a kilo of zinc sulfate per hectare and 100 litres of water on my, on my cereal crop, for example. Um, or it's going to be roughly a pound an acre, a, a, you know, pound an acre that kind of rate. And I, I won't try and convert litres back to, to gallons. But anyway, you guys can do that for me. Um, but basically... Why wouldn't you do that? It's a dollar twenty or something for I don't know what it is over there, but something like that kind of price for a kilo of zinc sulfate, pretty cheap option to fix your zinc. Why do people spend considerably more than that on collated zinc? And here's why: zinc is positively charged. It's a positively charged cation, and the leaf surface, in fact, the entire plant is strongly negatively charged. And when you foliar spray the zinc sulfate, there's a rush. The main entry point is under the leaf, tiny little mouth called a stomate that's actually there to suck up CO2, but also is a direct entry point. If you get in that mouth, you're into the plant, you're into the crop, it's a direct injection of that nutrition. And so there's a rush to that tiny little pore, you know, now to a magnet, positively charged zinc to the negatively charged leaf surface. And there's a traffic jam at that entry point and you get 6% out of 36, no, 8% out of 36% zinc or 30, no, 30, no, it's somewhere around that, 35, 36% zinc and zinc sulfate monohydrate. Um, so it's pretty inefficient. And what you're doing with a collating agent is that you're taking either something like a chemical like EDTA or the most powerful natural collating agent, which is fulvic acid. Uh, and the claw, the fulvic claw, that's what a collating agent does, or the EDTA claw wraps itself around the zinc, neutralizes the positive charge. There's no rush. There's no traffic jam and you've got maximum uptake of that nutrition. That's what collation is. So that's something that you will look at if you want the best response with anything. You take calcium nitrate, you collate it with fulvic acid. You know, usually we use like 300 grams per hectare, we'll say two kilos of, of fulvic acid per hectare, and you've created a calcium fulvate, which is a really, really well uptaken form of calcium to address calcium in your crop. So we're trying to miss the traffic jam. So... You know, as we said, there are chemical collating agents, but there are several natural collating agents, and they include fulvic acid, amino acids, and kelp. There's a collating agent in seaweed called mannitol, which is actually quite effective. And so you can just use seaweed as a collating agent if you choose. And of course, all of the 74 minerals found in that seaweed are naturally collated by that long chain carbohydrate called mannitol. So that makes them very valuable and makes seaweed a very valuable input in that context. So fulvic acid is considered to be the most powerful natural collating agent. Of course, it offers many other benefits. It's a, it's a root stimulant. It's a plant growth promoter. It's a hormonal. It's an auxin-like, so it gives larger leaves and so forth. So you're getting more than one benefit when you combine fulvic acid with your calcium nitrate or your zinc sulfate or your manganese sulfate if you've been using glyphosate and understand that glyphosate shuts down manganese and you need to compensate for that. So you're going to use some manganese sulfate with a little bit of fulvic acid to address that shutdown. So amino acids, we mentioned the story with kelp is that it um, also provides those 74 minerals from the ocean, with many of which are missing in the soil. Amino acids, there's several amino acids that are very good, but there's one called glycine, which is the smallest of the amino acids. And that's like, it wraps itself around the zinc, for example, uh, and basically it's so tiny, it just whips it in it within 11 to 17 minutes, all of the nutrition is in the plant if you're using glycine. So amino acids are another really good way of collating and they offer many other benefits to the plant. I'm a big fan of them. I use them all the time on, my, on all of my research farms. So putting the micros behind the minerals, what's that story about? 
why would we, if, we, if we've got into this concept of setting up a brewing apparatus, which can be quite inexpensive, 1,000 litre tanks, you can set up for five or $600, for example, um, but, but this is brewing your own living workforce, which is kind of you know, so simple and so inexpensive, it's kind of like an essential in my opinion. But if you've done that, uh, then you're crazy uh, put, ever putting nutrition out without including some of that biological support. And the reason for that is that that's the, the, those little mouths called stomates that I mentioned, they can open up to seven times their normal size. And there's a whole variety of things that govern stomatal opening. Now, one of them is potassium. If you're potassium deficient, and there's a link to boron, which you'll hear about in the podcast, so potassium and boron, um, but if you, then the stomate doesn't open and that affects everything, including photosynthesis. So that's a big story in its own right. <coughs> so I just have a quick mouthful of water here. Another very fascinating thing about stomatal opening is the finding that the frequency of bird song early in the morning opens the stomate to its full size. And so that's why either evening foliage brain or early in the morning is the best time because you're going to get better uptake. But the third uh, key to stomatal opening and maximum foliar response uh, is the sudden presence, a sudden influx of CO2. Now, when you spray some kind of living fertilizer, some kind of compost tea or some kind of inoculum that you've brewed up on farm, which can be done so inexpensively and so easily, and you put that with your nutrition, the microbes on the, the basically, the microbes that you put on there are going to, you know, you've got a, you've got a billion, you've got up to 5 billion organisms per teaspoon if you brew well, and they're all on the leaf surface. You just put out 50 or 100 liters of this mix. And that they're all breathing in oxygen and breathing out CO2. And the plant says, CO2, oh my God, and opens its stomate. And you get this dramatically, quite dramatic. Quite, uh, we've, got, we've got guys who've got massive levels of phosphate in this all growing strawberries who have to foliage spray zinc every two weeks because this phosphate shuts down the zinc. There's no point in putting it in the soil. They would normally use five litres per hectare of collated zinc. They use one litre with a compost tea behind it, and it works just as well. That's how powerful putting the microbes behind the minerals can be for you. I call it microbially enhanced nutrient delivery, the concept. Uh, understanding the pH factor, this basically if you're chasing a vegetative response, you use your pH meter and you try and have the solution at about seven and that drops down to six if you're chasing a reproductive response after flowering to get things kicking along at that end of the season. Uh, you can make a fruiting, you can get fruiting or a seeding response uh, with something called an acid shock, which is a whole different story where you're putting some phosphoric acid in there and getting, you know, just a little bit of a hit. The plant says, oh my God, but that's probably not relevant for you guys. It's more about fruiting crops. But a bag of citric acid is an essential, or several bags in the case of my farms of citric acid, absolutely essential. It's a really good way to lower pH of water because it's a natural collating agent that does some, some good. In fact, it actually gives a little bit of a plant growth response in the soil. So that's what you're going to drop your glyphosate down with, for example. So a waterproof pH meter and a bag of citric acid, absolutely essential. All chemicals have a sweet spot from the perspective of pH. And the finding with glyphosate 2.9 is where glyphosate kicks ass, as we say. Uh, it does best and um, significantly. I mean, you can reduce your glyphosate by 40% perhaps at, by dropping it down to 2.9 using citric acid. 100 grams drops 100 litres uh, by, by, by one pH point. So, but anyway, you've got a pH meter. You can find out how much you need to put in. You've got a fertilize, ongoing fertiliser response from the citric acid. I'm a great fan of it. I've done trials and seen what it does. Uh, so it's a cheap and expensive way to drop pH to get into that sweet spot. Diethane, sweet spot, 5.2. At 7, diethane lasts for 18 hours. It's got a half-life of 18 hours. You get double that. You get 36 hours of, product, of, of fungicidal protection from diethane at 7 pH. You drop it down, and it's not that much. It's like 150 grams. Normally, it takes 7 down to 5.2, maybe 200 grams per 100 litres of citric acid. And at 5.2, you've got 18 days half-life. Double that, you've got a month's protection versus a day and a half protection just because you understood the sweet spot from a pH perspective with chemicals. And if you like, we can send you independent research of five pages covering most farm chemicals and knowing where they work best. And that should be on the label. It's not because you don't need to legally and you're going to sell a lot less fungicide or pesticide if people knew uh, where its sweet spot was. So that's why you want the bag of citric acid and your waterproof pH meter as a standard tool in every shed. So a few sort of do-it-yourself kind of concepts. Ure urea and humic acid as a foliar spray are absolutely remarkable, probably the best and most efficient way 
to apply to apply nitrogen. We'll talk about that foliar urea a little later. We talked about citric acid. We talked about kelp fulvic acid with trace minerals to collate them. Uh, we talked about calcium nitrate, so I'll keep moving there. Um, we mentioned about mobility, and we mentioned how immobile cal calcium is and how really foliage brown it means you've got the direct hit and it can be so valuable in most crops. And we also talked about the timing, the early morning, putting microbes behind the minerals. So I'll just flick through these slides if we've covered them. Uh, young crops, we've got people, say, growing maybe cotton. Uh, they'll fol foliage spray when there's just four leaves. Uh, sometimes even two leaves. You're not using much nutrition. You're whooping over there really quickly. But young plants are so responsive to foliars. It's, uh, they've got faster ways to move that nutrition around in their systems metabolically and they just kick you can take a little lettuce and foliage spray something like triple 10 on a small lettuce plant and double it three days later it just goes woof that doesn't happen later on in the plant that's that's to do with the responsive nature of that young tissue so that's handy to know um, moon cycles is interesting um, there's quite good research now to support the fact that the best time to foliage spray is it so you know you can be doing it anytime but if you're going to do one once a month for example then the best time is the six, any of the six days leading up to a full moon. Now that's when the tides are at their highest, you're trying to move nutrients around that plant and that seems to be what the moon impacts. Uh, and while it sounds airy-fairy, it's actually researched and shown to be the case. And the worst movement or translocation of nutrition in the plant is any of the six days leading up to a new moon. That's when you never foliage spray because you're not going to get as good a response. So that's just a handy little thing. Mark your calendar if you're going to do a foliar, do it on any of the six days leading up to a full moon. Um, as I mentioned, leaf analysis, what do you want plant? Oh, that's what you want. Absolutely just a no brainer before flowering. And what you're gonna do usually is boron because boron is so important for um, basically for that whole, it lengthens the pollen tube and increases the fruit to flower ratio. And that's, you know, if you're trying to make some money, that's a pretty good concept. So that's usually important to, to you know, to check that. But boron before flowering, just, just important for every crop. A few things not, not to do um, you know humic acid is a wonderful um, input but it's not it's a strange acid natural acid that's only soluble in alkaline conditions and most of our inputs in agriculture um, are actually acidic so so that's why we use fulvic acid now fulvic acid you know together they're called humates humic and fulvic acid uh, fulvic acid is a genuine acid the ph of you know 3.7 or something um, and so you can put that with any input and collate and magnify that input but humic acid is very very limited urea has the right ph um, sodium borate what we call soluble over here is alkaline has the right ph to go with humic acid otherwise it just turns into a thick sludge on the bottom of your tank if you try and add humic acid to something acidic like calcium nitrate for example it's just you've messed up your tank you're going to have to shovel it out and you're not going to have a smile on your face at that point in time so a um, few other little things phosphate reacts with trace minerals so if, if you put some fulvic with the phosphate if you're trying to get a bit of um, a, a liquid phosphate and, and a little touch of phosphoric acid in the foliage but but you can sort of get away with that if you if you sort of complex the phosphate first with some fulvic and then add your trace minerals but it's hard to work with it's best to avoid if you can um urea you don't mix with one of these micronized liquid limes they don't go you actually have an ammonia release that's triggered there's a few little things you can see on the slide there to avoid um and I'll just flick through, you've got these notes. Basically, you know, you don't want to be squirting nutrition out. It really needs to be in a, in a, in a mist uh, and with a bit of pressure so that you can flip it on both sides of the leaf because you're aiming for the underside of the leaf. But a small droplet size for that small little mouth called a stomate is quite important to get in there and get that good efficient, efficiency. And it's a real problem now that so many people start a foliage brain pasture that you understand that you can't put it on, you can't graze down like you see that paddock grazed right down then try and foliage spray that with the cows at the top of the picture there because you're not foliage spraying, you're just putting a liquid fertilizer on the ground. You need to have four inches of growth uh, to make it a leaf based, a leaf delivery uh, rather than a soil delivery. And you won't get all the wonderful increased response if you're just pumping it onto the ground. It needs to be, you've got to, you've got to let that grow out a little bit before you try to foliage spray that pasture. So that's important. Um, yeah, so that, we'll talk a little more now about, I better keep an eye on time here and make sure we're going to get through what I wanted to get through in our time frame before you guys get to ask some questions. 
hope you're hanging in there okay with this flood of information. As I said, it's like drinking from a fire hose, but the notes will be available for you to go back to and you can ask whatever questions you like. But we're going to talk a little more for those of you who perhaps aren't familiar or who don't know the inside sort of story of these, of what have become probably, well, or something of a phenomenon, both in conventional and regenerative agriculture, the understanding of these two natural acids, which that's what you're making when you compost. If you are composting, the quality of that compost is determined by the percentage of the natural acids that you created during the composting process. So they're the most important components of what makes compost work well are two natural acids called humic and fulvic acid, which together are called humates. And so it turns out that you can extract these materials from certain forms of brown coal uh, and concentrate them up, and then we can bring them in really, and it turns out that they do a lot of what, what organic matter does in the soil. Uh, it's sort of like a concentrate. It's almost like a Band-Aid for a lack of organic matter in terms of some of the benefits of these two natural acids. So in fact, if we look at the benefits of humic acid and we look at the benefits of humus or organic matter, they are exactly the same. Buffering of pH, so normally pH has a big impact on nutrient uptake, but if you've got good organic matter levels in your soil, you can get away with much less of that, that uh, impact, like a pH of 5.2 normally is going to shut down a whole range of minerals, or a higher pH of, of 8.2 is going to shut down basically five of the trace minerals are going to be less uptaken. But if you've got high organic matter, that may not necessarily be the case because it buffers the impact of pH. The retention of minerals. So we understand that minerals are stored. So the cations are stored on the clay colloid. Colloid just means small particle size. And so clay is negatively charged. And so it's like a, like a, it's like a Velcro that grabs hold of positively charged calcium, magnesium, potassium, zinc, the, the cations they're called. So that's part of the storage. And then you've got the organic matter, the humus colloid, and that can also have Velcro sites that can grab hold of the positives, but it's the only thing that has negative Velcro sites, if you think of it like that, that can grab hold, um, sorry, positive, that can grab hold of negative. So it's, so it's the only thing that stores negatively charged anions. So clay stores cations, has negative that grabs positive, and um, I said it the wrong way around a minute ago, I just realized, um, and humus, is the, can store both. It can, it's the only thing that can store very leachable nitrate, nitrogen, or sulfur, which is deficient in, in many, many crops that I visit around the world, uh, or boron, the most leachable trace mineral. So uh, mineral retention. So, you've, so, so the CC is a measure of the clay component of the soil. And so you know, your CC might, might be 10 or 20 or 30 if it's a heavier clay soil, or five if it's a sand soil. Um, but the CC, of, of humus is 250, the CC of humic acid is 450. See, it's like a concentrate of humus, so it really can hold on to things, particularly in a lighter soil. Soil detoxification, the higher your humus, the less the impact of chemical residues in that soil, and that's humic acid has exactly the same effect. Collation in the root zone, promotion of crumb structure, plant growth promotion with this oxen hormonal effect on root and leaf size. Uh, solubilization of mineral fertilizers, managing sodium um, is what the higher your humus level, the less damage you'll get from high sodium and saline irrigation water and so forth. Well, humic acid does exactly the same. It's, it's pretty much a mirror image. It's a concentrate of humus uh, and can be used as a band-aid for a lack of humus in some soils. So the two things from a mineral point of view that, that both humic and fulvic acid do is that they stabilize and they magnify. So we'll talk about how they do both of those. First of all, we're talking about magnifying because this is pretty important and it's probably the biggest reason that people get excited about these two natural acids because both of them do it. So how do they magnify? Well, th things go through, nutrients go in, to, or chemicals for that matter, go in through the cell wall and then there's a cell membrane. Think of that little membrane inside an eggshell, that little fine membrane. Um, and basically, they've got, they've got to go through that membrane. And calcium sits at the membrane and determines what comes and comes out. That's why we call calcium the trucker of all minerals. It does that on human cells and it does it on our cells. Um, but what happens is that membrane becomes more permeable. So it can absorb, it basically becomes more, has more absorbent capacity. Uh, so it sucks things in about 30% more efficiently. Some say about 30 to 35%, the, fit the research shows, and there are multiple published papers on this. It's called cell sensitization. Whatever you've put humic or fulvic acid with, 
you can use or you can get a third better response. So you might put some humic acid granules with your DAP and MAP, for example, and you're going to actually several other benefits, but essentially you're going to have this third better phosphate uptake associated with that. You can put um, some fulvic acid with your glyphosate, with your Roundup, and you'll use a third, about 30% less glyphosate because you've got better uptake and better utilization of that. And that's the magnification effect of humic and fulvic acid. Now, the collation thing, we've already talked about how that works and why that works. Uh, both of them are very powerful collating agents, humic and fulvic. It's just that fulvic is more versatile because it goes with everything and humic acid being actually alkaline doesn't go with most of our, our, our acidic inputs. So, and then we see with humic acid that things like borons and sulfates and things that, anions that leach very easily can be complex. You can't collate an anion that's called complexing where you form what's called a boron humate and now it can't leach because humic acid doesn't leach. So you bond humic and fulvic together, sorry, humic and boron together uh, and you can't leach that material anymore, which is basically you would never use boron without humic acid. Immediately you create a boron humate, it goes in 30% 30, 30 better or a third better, uh, which is a pretty cool concept. Um, so, and this is pretty important if you've got issues with excessive sodium and we've got them everywhere. What you're looking at, well, that, that's actually a greenhouse, of course, tomato crop, but what you're looking at is a soil that contains 27% sodium-based saturation, which is just insane. And you shouldn't really be able to grow tomatoes in that. And how they get away with that is they take soluble humic acid, our soluble humic acid granules, they dissolve it at one to 10, uh, which is a simple way to make it do it yourself, humic acid, uh, and then they'll put, you know, sometimes as little as a couple of liters per hectare, but a little bit of, humic, of that do-it-yourself humic acid, which is quite inexpensive, just, you know, 30, 40 cents a liter or whatever it works out at here. And they'll put that, they'll fertigate that and basically buffer the sodium. Humic acid is really, really good for buffering uh, saline conditions or, or either saline irrigation water or sodium, high sodium soils. So that's one of the tricks for, you know, addressing that. And you can do it inexpensively if you make your this do-it-yourself humic acid and have a few thousand litres sitting there. Uh, I, I do do that on my farms. I've got thousand litres. I've got what's called Nutrition Central. It's a 40-foot container filled with 200-litre drums and thousand-litre drums of all the key things, all with smart valves, all tied back to a controller that then can be controlled by my phone. I can get my leaf test. I can click, click, click on the phone and everything. And I've got an outside that 40-foot container, which is filled with nutrition. It's what's called Nutrition Central is my brewing tanks and they're all connected to smart valves. So we'll brew up whatever we decide to brew up and we never put a mineral without a microbe behind it. So always there's gonna be some trichoderma for disease management or some beneficial anaerobes for about 30 things that they offer and they're gonna go and they're so easy. You can brew them up yourselves in 10 days uh, once it warms up, which is starting to do there now. Um, and so these are just things that we'll perhaps talk about as we get there. But I'll just quickly, I want you to understand um, the, the, the affinity and what I call a perfect partnership between humic acid and urea. We mentioned there's not many things that that cheaper humate called humic acid can go with, but urea is one of them. It's a perfect pH. Uh, you put them together, you put either little, little crystalline granules with the granular urea, they dissolve, you can dissolve them first together if you choose, but what happens is that immediately you create a urea humate. Now the problem with urea, it's the world's most popular nitrogen source, is that it converts very, very quickly to a nitrate, which, and on the process of conversion, there's some, some volatilization, there's some loss of nitrous oxide into the atmosphere, and nitrates then leach very readily. And when nitrates go into the plant, they go in with water, which if you've had a big dose of nitrogen, then you've diluted, you take a lot of water into the plant to carry that, that, that nitrogen into the plant. And you've got a dilution factor that lowers bricks levels, creates a calling card for insect pressure. And most of you would have noticed that increase in ins insect pressure following a nitrogen a urea application, very, very common thing to see in agriculture. So. The concept of combining them, good research, 60% increase in the performance of urea when you combine it with humic acid. So that's the starting point. That's the formation of your urea humate. But soon we'll talk about the idea of what happens when you foliar spray your urea. It's a completely different phenomenon in terms of how you can fast track protein building in your plant and why and how that works. We'll talk about that shortly. Um, just a few little more technical features of how do you define a good versus a bad humic acid? 
Um, basically, it's not saying, oh, well, they've both got 70 or 80% humic acid, so they're identical because they're not. They came from different forests in different parts of the world with different mineralization. They're huge, and minerals, of course, build all the beneficial compounds. So they're hugely different. The percentage of humic acid is irrelevant in terms of quality. What you look at is what's called functional groups. And these are things like phenols, you know, these phenolic compounds, this kind of antioxidant compounds, amino acids, quinones, carboxyls. And the higher the levels of those, the better the humic acid. So that's, that's important. Um, so basically there are three humates. There's something called humans in the brown coal. And that is, is the largest fraction, as they call it, the humate fraction. Uh, and it's compl it holds the minerals. So those, those, those ancient forests had the full spectrum of 74 minerals, but they're not in humic and fulvic acid. They've got completely different purposes. Um, the human fraction, H-U-M-I-N, holds those minerals and it's insoluble so you can't can't easily that's where my where sometimes you can micronize and we do that we micronize the raw brown coal the concentrated brown coal and then we get access to all of that mineralization because we we, we we created such a small particle size to make it available but humic acid is 10 times smaller than a human what's called not a you know human in that context cc of 450 uh fulvic acid is 10 times smaller again which means they can leach so humic acid is preferable in the soil because it can never leach. It's too big a particle size. So it can hold things like boron and nitrate, nitrogen and so forth in the soil so they won't leach. Whereas if you tied boron to a fulvic acid, then you can leach some of it at some point. So uh, that's an issue and something to be aware of. Fulvic acid's got a CC of 1400, humic acid a CC of 450. So fulvic acid's got massive capacity to absorb things. And that's why it's a really good thing to put with glyphosate because basically it sucks the glyphosate into the molecule, it goes through the plant a third more efficiently, now it's in the soil, still tied to this 1400cc fulvic molecule, and fulvic acid's the most powerful known food for bacteria, and the only organisms, or the predominant organisms that break down glyphosate in the soil are bacteria. They come like bees to a honeypot to that 450cc uh, C to that to that 1400 cc fulvic acid molecule because uh, they love this stuff to like bees to a honeypot and then they they don't like glyphosate they wouldn't choose to break it down but that fast they've got no choice they're chasing the fulvic and in the process they fast track the breakdown of the glyphosate so it makes makes glyphosate a little more sustainable in that context um differentiating between products so there are there are humic and fulvic acid or humates that come from leonardite or lignite. So those are two types of brown coal. And the finding is that leonardite, which is usually on the surface and it's been oxidized for well, many, some, sometimes many hundreds of thousands of years, that's much more active. And so you need to know what you're buying if you're buying a human. Is it a lignite or is it a leonardite? Because the leonardite, it's about twice as good. There's nothing wrong with a lignite, but you need twice as much as a, as a leonardite based humic acid to get the same response. So that's that's handy to know. So it's just a few little tips with humates. Young plants will really respond to it. So that's why people will run around when they've got just two leaves and they'll put out some fulvic or whatever. They're really good to build bricks levels. Um, a combination of humic and fulvic together, uh, potato growers, for example, gives a hell of an impact on root growth. Um, sometimes if you're foliar sprain, um, you know, if you haven't got the capacity to put it through the roots and that's where liquid injection and broad acre you're always going to put a little bit of humic and fulvic in with that li liquid injection, depending on what else you're putting in there. It might be just fulvic if you've got acidic inputs going in there. But that gives you that wonderful early root growth initiation if you can get it in liquid inject at the start. So that's just a few little other little tips. I'll just see if there's any. Like, you know, if we're going to get paid, which we will at some point for building stable humus in the soil, there's going to be carbon credits. I mean, some countries have already adopted that. It's hugely important if we're going to step in and try and uh, counter this climate change challenge, then putting humus in the soil is the biggest strategy of doing that. Um, and so if carbon sequestration, as it's called, is going to be a new income stream, humates are probably, humic acid specifically is probably the most important because it stimulates, unlike fulvic, which stimulates bacteria, humic acid feeds up beneficial fungi that create the stable humus in the soil that'll last for about 35 years, probably longer than most of what you, you'll be farming. Um, and so it's hugely important in that context. It's the most powerful way to stimulate the fungi that build stable carbon in your soil. So I, I like I said, I'm always, when I'm at my farm every weekend, uh, I'll, I'll have a couple of thousand litre tanks because we put humic acid constantly. We've got light sandy soils and it's just so good in those soils. 
we're harvesting some absolutely delicious apples. I've not tasted apples that good before, and I'm being quite honest, I'm really impressed with them. We just started harvest last week. But um, yeah, when you're taking the soluble humic granules and dissolving them, the easy way in a thousand litre container is just to get an air blower. We just have one with a fat, fat, like not this ordinary garden hose, but the next size up on it. And you just have that and it's just got the entire tanks just blowing like crazy. They cost about $150. Obviously, you've got a power there, but that's just a swirling mass. And when you drop the soluble granules, or you can do it with soluble powders, um, you dissolve it quite quickly. But after you've finished, you know, you leave that in there for a bit and let it stir it up thoroughly, and there'll be a bit of sludge. If you then just let it settle down. Uh, usually, you leave it sitting in the tank for 24 hours before you use it and let the sludge settle out on the bottom of the tank. And that sludge will clog filters, so you don't want to pump off the bottom of the tank. You're going to take, you know, the top 95% and you'll have that sludge. Uh, and then you just open the tap and pour out the sludge. The sludge is not something you throw away. The sludge is that human fraction with all those trace minerals in it, the insoluble portion that I mentioned earlier, and you put that on your veggie garden or on your fruit trees or whatever, if you've got a veggie garden or fruit trees, or give it away to someone who has, because that is a wonderful, wonderful fertiliser. It's what I use on my veggie gardens on the farm. So... Um, Humic acid, really good for drought resistant. It holds seven times its own weight in water. Uh, and uh, basically, there's a whole range of processes where it can be, it can help mitigate dry conditions. So it's including what it does to sodium, which of course is a, can be a huge issue. Um, liquid micronized lime has become quite a big input. We were the very first to do that some 22 years ago, and now it's all over the world. But micronizing, holding it in liquid with certain gums uh, or just getting the micronized powders and using them, combining them in a folio with humic acid. New research out of Holland, combining humic acid and micronized liquid lime actually triggers, you know, it's, it's micronized calcium carbonate. You can hear the word carbon in there. CO2 is part of the carbonate component. And when you basically, the humic acid component liberates the CO2. So you spray it on the leaf and now you get the sudden influx of CO2 and the stomachs say yes, and they suck up that CO2 combine it with water and sunlight, build more glucose and build more yield. And it's a really good finding. It's a really good uh, yield building strategy that's really inexpensive. It's just two liters of liquid lime is, is the kind of amount you would use per hectare, not per acre. So whatever that comes back to per acre with this little bit of humic acid in there to create that release of CO2 on the leaf surface. It's a really cool tip. Just try it and you'll see what I'm talking about. So, um, so, Here's a few little six specific humic acid strategies. Uh, number one, you never use urea, either in the soil or as a foliar, without creating what's called a urea humate. The moment you combine them, you've stabilized your urea, urea. It doesn't volatilize, volatilize and go up into the atmosphere. It doesn't leach and go down as a nitrate. You're going to utilize all of that urea when you form a urea humate. Number two, and this is sort of, you only got to do half a paddock, if you call them fields, whatever you call them, uh, with and half a paddock without, um, but you're combining 5% soluble humate granules with your DAP and MAP. And now there's four things that are happening when you do that. Number one, uh, basically, what, happen, what DAP and MAP are, are, are the phosphorus is the hottest mineral. Uh, you think of a phosphorus torch. I mean, it's, you don't get hotter than phosphorus. And phosphoric acid is just a burning, really hot acid. And what DAP is, is just phosphoric acid with an or MAP with an ammonium ion tagged on. So phosphorus has got three negative charge, ammonium's got one positive, you tag it on, and that ammonium's alkaline, and that buffers that burning potential of phosphoric acid. You put it in the soil, it ionizes apart, and you've got raw phosphoric acid, which burns roots. But more importantly, the little organisms that bar into that root and expand out and give you 10 times the original surface area of the roots, this massive maze of filaments that are like a giant root extension, that's mycorrhizal fungi, the wonder of mycorrhizal fungi and their potential, that's sizzled like putting a blowtorch on human hair in the face of raw phosphoric acid. When you put humic acid granules with your DAP and form a phosphate humate, that doesn't happen. So you just protected your mycorrhizal fungi and you protected the burn on your roots by combining that 5% of the soluble humate granules with your DAP and MAP. So that's number one. Then not only did you protect and buffer some of that damage to mycorrhizal fungi, it's now thought that the reason that 90% of the mycorrhizal fungi, the major reason, there are multiple reasons, but the most important reason for the loss 
of mycorrhizal fungi, 90% of our soils have got none left, and it's a pretty big loss, uh, is, is DAP, MAP, and that burning effect that I just described. So if you can stop that, that is a huge benefit for you. Now, then you've got the most powerful stimulant of fungi. You remember, fulvic is the most powerful bacterial stimulant. Humic acid is the most powerful fungal stimulant. So we've got the humic acid stimulating beneficial fungi, including microbes fungi, so getting those good guys that can build humus and so forth and deliver nutrients to protect from disease and so forth. You've got that happening in your soil. You've created a phosphate humate. We've talked about you put out DAP, MAP, you're getting 27% of your investment. 1000 bucks, you got $270, and the balance of that became this massive frozen reserve of phosphate, which in Australia they say is $10 billion minimum, but the industry itself will acknowledge you're getting less than a third. You're getting 27%, just over a quarter of what you invested. The rest of it's locked up. If you form a phosphate humate, you don't lock up phosphate with calcium and alkaline soils, with iron, uh, with manganese, with aluminium and more acidic soils and form that insoluble compound. You retain all of your DAP and MAP if you create a phosphate humate that can't lock up with other things. And you've got, humic you've got, sorry, you've got phosphorus available for the full crop cycle. It, the reason you're not screaming scam, why did I pay $1,000 and get $270? Is because you were taught that if you didn't, you know, if you didn't use phosphorus at the early stage, you wouldn't get good root establishment. And that's a really important role of phosphorus and it really does apply. So you think, well, that's all I'm chasing and that's what I got, so I'm happy. You shouldn't be happy. It's, there's 50% more phosphorus needed for cell division for vegetative growth. And at six weeks in, it's all locked up. So you, you got what you thought you wanted, which is good. You got that early root growth initiation. Six weeks later, where well, you should still have phosphorus, you haven't got it, it's tied up and you need 50% more than that early start. Now, for, and then from flowering onwards, you need twice the amount of phosphorus, and now most times you simply haven't got it. You can check your leaf analysis and see phosphorus plummet from flowering onwards. But watch the paddock, the half of the paddock where you combine the humic acid with the phosphorus. The phosphorus is still there after flowering, and that's a pretty nice benefit for you from a, a productivity and a profitability perspective. So that's a huge reason to, and it's free, essentially because of that increased uptake, we mentioned both humic and fulvic increased uptake with cell sensitization by one third, you can put the cost of it, you can take off your DAP and MAP and it's a free inclusion. So, you know, if you're gonna invest 20 bucks with the humates or $15, whatever it costs over there to do, to put your 5%, then you take that off your DAP bill and you will never suffer because you've got that third better uptake. So it's kind of like, it's, it's like a free input. Just do it once on half the paddock and you'll see what, we don't have any growers who've ever done that, who don't say, okay, that's what I do in future. I will include 5% soluble humate granules with my DAP and MAP. So, Humic acid, because of its stimulation of fungi who create the larger crumbs, that's one of the roles of fungi in the soil, bacteria spit out a sticky, slimy material and create this, this little granule, this little aggregate, and then fungi wrap that into a larger crumb and now in comes oxygen from the atmosphere. The, ox the organisms around the roots and the plant roots themselves utilize oxygen, then they breathe out and they breathe out CO2. And we want CO2 to move freely through that crumb structure and the plant leaves waiting with thousands of tiny mouths and that's how you grow stuff. The better you do that, that's called gas exchange. How freely does oxygen come in and how freely does CO2 move out of the soil and then get sucked up by the leaf, combined with water and sunlight to build glucose, which is how you grow a crop. So the better you manage gas exchange, the better you do, and fungi are the most important component. Uh, the la my last big talk uh, before COVID shut me down uh, was 250 people in New Zealand uh, with Nicole Master, who's a great consultant from New Zealand. We had a five-day course together. We had five farmers from five countries, not from Canada. We had the US, we had the UK, we had Australia and New Zealand. Well, maybe we did have a connect. But anyway, we had five people, five farmers, all broadacre farmers, and what they described was interesting because they all got a half hour on stage to talk about their experience with the regenerative model. They're all good success stories in their own regions and their own right. But all of them had the same common thread to their story. When they improved their fungi to bacteria ratio, when they started getting more fungi into their soil, everything started turning around. It's the absolute essence of success in broad acres to change that, to get that fungi component, get that soil breathing. The most important element and growing a crop is not N, it's not P, it's not K, it's not even calcium, which is probably a little more important than N, P, and K in actual fact. It's none of those things. It's called oxygen. 
oxygen. Think about yourself, your last two minutes, close off your oxygen pathways, unless you're a pill diver, you've got, you've got 60, to, 60 seconds to two minutes and then you're done. Well, oxygen is the single most important thing for the roots, for the organisms around that root. Uh, they've got to have oxygen and that's what you're managing. Oxygen coming in, CO2 coming out, which is called gas exchange. That's one of your principal roles when you grow a crop. I'm a manager of gas exchange. The better I do that, the better I will do. So continuing with our six specific humic acid strategies, um, wonderful tool for dealing with um, soil salinity. Now, the do-it-yourself stuff, some of them are using in high sodium soils or when they've got saline irrigation water, as much as five to 10 litres per hectare that they're feeding. And they're getting a growth response, a big root response with that. But uh, it's a really good way to manage sodium. It, it creates, basically you can't absorb, you create this, this sodium humate that can't be absorbed so efficiently through into the plant to cause damage. Uh, it sort of isolates the sodium. Now, number four, the Australian Ag, the Victorian Ag Department did some good work about 22 years ago uh, where they looked at adding humic acid with lime and they just got this really, really dramatic enhanced calcium storage and calcium availability uh, and you know understanding that lime's only got five kilos of soluble calcium and it's, you're trying to kick in the, the other 395 kilos as quick as possible and humic acid helps facilitate that and it helps store the, the calcium in the soil it stimulates the fungi that are responsible for calcium storage so there's a sort of a, a double benefit there most soils are lacking in those cellulose digesting fungi as i mentioned so continuing um Basically, we're talking about soil fertility and structure. So humic and fulvic acids react with the metal and clay minerals and they form what are called organometal or organoclay complexes. And look at, look at this one little sentence. These reactions modify the permeability, the porosity, the water retaining capacity, the absorption characteristics, the surface area, and the cation exchange reactions. That's a massive game-changing impact on soil structure and that's the potential that's why they've become this huge phenomenon uh, this humic and fulvic acid the use of humates in terms of soil structure now fulvic acid and humic acid do pretty much identical things but the points of difference uh, we're looking at fulvic acid uh, and and we and we just quickly talk and i'll talk about what that what they both do and what they don't, what, what folic does different to humic. So both of them promote root growth. You can combine them and get an even better root growth, but both of them stimulate, uh, it's an oxen-like stimulation of root growth. So you get more cell elongation, longer roots, more vibrant roots and so forth. Both humic and folic acid do that. Now, folic is quite unique in making locked up phosphate available, much more so than humic. There are, there are seven published papers on hum and folic's capacity to solubilize locked up phosphate in your soil. So that's something it does better than humic. Um, prolong, prolong, prolonged production, now that doesn't apply to you because you don't want prolonged production, but in greenhouse crops you're growing tomatoes, you can get four months longer out of a, three to four months longer out of tomato crop. You know, they grow them for over here for 10 months or something. Um, that's something unique to fulvic, the humic doesn't do. But both of them promote growth promotion, a larger leaf with that oxen hormone stimulation. Both of them detoxify pollutants in the soil, magnify nutrient uptake, improve moisture retention. Fulvic stimulates bacteria, humic stimulates fungi. But the second sun is interesting because it may be of maybe importance to you, you know, as springtime kicks in and you get, but you're still having a lot of gray days. You want to photosynthesize, build the building block of everything, including your profit, which is called glucose. You don't need sunlight. It's sunlight, water, and CO2 that build glucose through the little sugar factories called chloroplasts. Uh, so you've got to have sunlight in the equation, and everyone knows how everything grinds to a halt when you don't have sunlight, and particularly relevant in Europe, but just as about relevant at you at certain times of the year. So what they've discovered with fulvic, and no one can explain that again, there are multiple papers, but no one has, in my opinion anyway, no one has aptly described the mechanism but they just know it works and they call fulvic the second sun you can use it you know quite small rates of 300 grams as a folia per hectare three to four hundred grams per hectare and the plant starts photosynthesis you can watch it with bricks levels bricks are standing still because you're not making sugars without sunlight suddenly you're making sugars how's that happening no one quite understands but it does happen and that's why they refer to fulvic acid as the second sun it's a really interesting phenomenon and it most certainly works so 
Uh, folic acid should be included with contact herbicides, but don't put it with uh, a specific her herbicide that you don't want to kill something else because sometimes, because it, it magnifies the impact, if it's a marginal thing, sometimes it'll kill things that it wasn't killing before. So you've got to be very careful uh, with, with, because of its increased performance of whatever you're putting it with, uh, be very careful about what you combine it with in that context. Um, natural collating agent we talked about. I promote something called the fulvic cleanse. Now my newest farm, this large apple farm, 43 years of chemicals. The chemical shed was like bigger than my lounge room, much bigger than my lounge room. Uh, just lined with everything because it doesn't exist because we're doing it with no chemicals. But um, huge inputs for 43 years. And so I've got you know, low soil life counts and we're thinking, well, it's going to take years to correct. So we came in and we cleaned and we didn't do it once, we actually did it three times, but it's three kilograms per hectare of soluble fulvic acid. Of course, you've got to try and put it out. So you'd have to do it with boom sprays in your instance if you're wanting to do that because you, you haven't got fertigation, but uh, cleanses up the soil. I mean, you can measure before and after, and you can, but most of the simple thing to do is measure soil life counts using a wonderful new little tool called a microbiometer, which measures biological biomass or microbial biomass in the soil. And you can, if, when the chemicals are there, it's low. And as you suck them out with each one of these cleansers, the numbers increase and increase and increase. And then you know you're on the right track. But it's a great strategy if you had a lot of chemicals on your soil, then you know it's not working the way your dad's soil worked. And that Part of that accumulation of chemicals can be the cause of that reduced performance. And so you do a little trial on 100 square metres where you put 30 grams, a couple of heap tablespoons of fulvic uh, onto that little area, just boom spray it on that little area and watch. And if you see a transformation of that area, then it's probably worth investing on a larger scale and cleaning up using the fulvic cleanse to clean up your soil. So let's talk a little bit about seed treatment. How am I going? I've got um, 25 minutes left of this before we start asking questions. So I'll see how much more I can get through. I'm not sure where I'm at in terms of the total number of slides, but anyway, we'll keep, keep going. Seed treatment, kind of a, another one of these no brainers because you're putting this little bit, of, you basically understand that you've got a, a perfect plant and all the nutrition it requires all enclosed is what a seed is. And so you don't need a whole bunch. You don't need a whole bunch of NPK under a tiny little plant. It's just kind of insanity. It's kind of, it's kind of like, um, like giving a, a five-year-old a hundred bucks a week pocket money and saying, "Off you go, go and manage that." I mean, you know, they don't. They're not equipped to manage that amount of nutrition, nor is the child equipped to manage that much of that much finances at that point. And you're going to have a whole lot. Of, you get a hundred bucks with a lollies rotting his teeth or whatever. Uh, so. This is the, the scenario with, with this, uh, small amounts, but it's well-chosen uh, supplements that you're going to put on there just to give that earlier kickstart. And it's like mother's milk, hence the mother's milk photo there, because basically you've got key minerals, sometimes a microbial component, not sometimes, always, if you can. Some humates, uh, some, some key stimulants, and that's where kelp is really important. Uh, to get that crop off to a bigger root structure and a bigger, a visibly larger, more vibrant young crop, usually, depending on whether you manage, how you manage the rest of the crop, but usually that'll translate to a better yield. It's, it's like mother's milk, you get a better adult uh, with breastfed children, and there's a lot of research to support that. So um, one thing, so let's look at the microbes that you might use on your seed treatment. So microbial fungi, as we mentioned, well, I don't know if I did mention it, 90% of these organisms are missing from our soil. They, you can see that plant on the right hand corner, the yellow, dark yellow color is the main root and that massive extension of these filaments of mycorrhizal hyphae that give you this massive root extension. So let's talk about what they can offer. Well, they can go and get minerals that are really immobile. The two most immobile minerals are phosphate and zinc. Now they sit where you put them. Phosphate doesn't leach. People say, oh, the, we've got green ocean because we've got algal blooms from phosphate leach. You know, phosphate can't leach. Uh, phosphate can erode with topsoil and feed up those algal blooms along with nitrogen, but it doesn't leach. It's the most stable of all minerals in the soil. It sits where you put it, which means it's not floating around in soil solution for the plant to pick up like it does potassium it's got to go and get the phosphorus. And that's where the mycorrhizal extension gives you greater access to the two most immobile minerals, which are phosphate and zinc. So you get much better phosphate and zinc if you can get these guys living on your roots and putting on the seeds, a good way to get that happening. Because they basically, the 
basically, as the seed germinates, they germinate, burrow in, and begin this synergistic relationship with the plant that lasts for the full life of the plant, and then leaves a little bit of a matrix of that mycorrhizal hyphae for you to plant into next time round. You never, ever want to practice a chemical fallow if you want to look after your mycorrhizal fungi. It's, I mean, that, the mycorrhizal fungi don't care if it's a weed uh, or a cover crop. It's going to be the far, far better option. You never leave soil bare. Where does nature do that? If you look at the definition of the word science, the definition of science in Webster's Dictionary is adherence to natural laws and principles. You've got a perfect blueprint, this wonderful interrelated marvel called nature, and you're supposed to learn from it. You're not supposed to say, oh, we can do better than that. We tried that. We're on our knees staring down the chasm with the arrogance that thinks you can do better than perfection. You learn from nature. That's what science is. And so I don't know how I digressed into that, into that but, um, but basically just continuing the, the role of mycorrhizal fungi, um, it, that, that, that extension of hyphae releases acids. All fungi do this, including mycorrhizal fungi. And that gently breaks the bond between locked up phosphate and calcium or locked up phosphate and, and iron, for example, and more acidic soils and releases, you know, what we're looking for is calcium and phosphorus because they are the most important two minerals for the most important process. Calcium and phosphorus are the most important minerals for photosynthesis. And so having a, an organism on your roots is spewing out an acid that's breaking the bond between the two most and delivering both of those minerals to the plant. That's a pretty nice outcome, as you will see when we look at yield and so forth. And then we see things like potassium, which can become, some soil types can, be trapped, can become trapped in a clay plate, like a sandwich. Think of it like a sandwich. And the, the, all the potassium ions, because it's a small ion, can fit between the little platelets of clay, and you only get it when it oozes out the end. But if you've got micros or fungi, they just burrow into that sandwich and help themselves. And so they can mine potassium within clay platelets, which, you know, it's an expensive mineral. It's pretty handy to have that. If you've got, if you've got problems with root knot nematodes, common, you know, that's the most destructive of all crop pests, understand this, you cannot have root knot nematodes and mycorrhizal fungi on the same plant. They cannot coexist. Mycorrhizal fungi are totally antagonistic, actually poisonous to root knot nematodes. And so rather than using $3,000 a hectare on a nematocyte, get mycorrhizal, have all these other benefits, and you can't have nematodes and mycorrhizal fungi together. So recolonize with mycorrhizal fungi. And then when we start talking about the bigger challenge, the climate change challenge, the thing that's got you at 14 degrees at this time of the year, which is ridiculous, hasn't happened since early last century. Uh, that's part of what we're seeing globally with this climate change phenomenon. Uh, and when we start talking about how can we counter that, we've got one little creature that can do that better than any. And that comes from Dr. Sarah Wright's finding in 1996 that mycorrhizal fungi spit out the sticky substance called glomalin. And glomalin, we now know, is actually a, a triggering mechanism for about 30% of all the humus in the soil. Now, if we can get them back and start building all that humus, that's direct carbon sequestration. It's actually one of the most potent strategies for countering the climate change challenge, the biggest challenge we've ever faced. faced. And every government should be sponsoring mycorrhizal fungi, inoculation with mycorrhizal fungi to get this happening. And it's not just we're not going to stop killing them off after we put them in, but if better than nothing, we can put them in each year, but we've got to have them there. They are so important in that context. Uh, other things, so that's something you can add. You know, we'll, our guys will put on seven, eight dollars. Now, that's not going to give you full coverage, but what you get for your seven, eight dollars, and it might be by the end of the season, 30 percent coverage, 25 percent coverage, but it's there and it's moving and it's moving from crop to crop and it's even if there's weeds there, it's hitting the weeds and they're starting to colonise and you've got this little bit of a matrix that then you can go on planting into and you've got better colonisation for your next crop. So that's the goal of investing that $10 or whatever you invest. If you want, if you can justify it, you've got good enough yields, you can put in more and get more coverage on that single season. But that's what our guys over here do is that sort of $8, 9 investment on their seed of, of our product called Platform, which is a blend of mycorrhizal fungi. Uh, it's actually got some trichoderma with it as well. Now, trichoderma you can also use, and, and I will promise you that if you can get trichoderma on that seed, uh, most of the things that you're putting fungicide on your seed will be controlled because most of the damping off disease, like Pythium, for example, in fact, all of the damping, Google whatever disease, early disease you're suffering from, and Google 
just put that disease, let's say put Pythium and Trichoderma in Google and have a look at the, well, there's probably a dozen studies in that instance on Trichoderma's capacity. Well, in fact, what you're looking at in the top right hand corner is Trichoderma wrapping itself around the high favor of Pythium and sucking the guts out of it. It's a predatory fungi that controls 32 different disease organisms. Some of the most destructive disease organisms can be controlled with trichoderma. It burrows into your roots, unlike the fungicide last six weeks, the fungicide treated seed last six weeks, the trichoderma will be there till the end of your crop. It lives with the plant, like, sort of like mycorrhizal, and will give you that disease protection. And not just does it protect by eating organisms, but it produces three biochemicals that stimulate the immunity of that crop. And that's a good outcome because that's called immune elicitation and there's no known immune elicitor that doesn't boost yield. So you've got a yield boosting function from having trichoderma on your roots. Now, seed treatment nutrition, kelp is the big one. 74 minerals from the ocean, uh, mannitol, that natural collating agent, so all the minerals are naturally collated. Um, but basically the big story is the presence of four hormones that are found in kelp. Uh, just, just one little thought before we get to the four hormones. I mean, it, it's filled with long chain sugars that fungi love. And we try, remember I said that story, all five farmers at my last conference, when they got the fungi back, things turned around. Well, one of the ways to get the fungi back is the comp, they love complex carbohydrates. That's why the biggest foods for beneficial fungi to get them back in your soil are humic acid filled with long chain sugars. Fulvic acid is not, humic acid is. That's why it feeds fungi. And kelp are the two most powerful fungal foods. Uh, complex carbohydrates and kelp and humic acid. But as I said, the most important component is these natural hormones, cytokines, gibberellins, oxygens, and betanes. Kelp is 40 times more than the next closest plant on the planet. And what you find is that those hormones, which are used for every stage of plant growth, those hormones are basically built from minerals. And we took a lot of minerals out over a lot of years. Every time you take a crop, you remove a bit of all the original 74 minerals and we put back a handful of them. So there's a lot of things not in our soil. There's a lot of building blocks missing for the build. The exception to that is the seaweed plant, which is bathed in the perfect balance of all 74 minerals, still intact. We didn't suck them out of the sea yet. So we've got 74 minerals. And what does that mean? Well, it means it's got 40 times more because it's got the building blocks, 40 times more of these four hormones that every plant uses for every stage of its growth cycle, including germination, vegetative enhancement, it's the conversion switch, switch over from vegetative to flower and then sizing seed. All of that's hormone driven from those four hormones that are 40 times higher in kelp. And what does that mean for a kelp plant? That's what it means. If you can see my fingers, that's how much a kelp plant grows, 30 centimetres, one foot every day of the week, fueled by... 40 times more hormones than the other. And that's why you use kelp. And it's wonderful because of that hormonal component to put a small amount on the seed. And there are so many studies. Just Google kelp and seed treatment and you'll see for yourself how many studies there are in terms of enhancing germination and getting that early root growth with that little bit of kelp on your seed. Really inexpensive and really worth considering. Um, the kind of minerals that you're going to include in that little mix that you're going to make your own. I mean, we, we make something called seed start which is like a couple of bucks a hectare to, uh, to treat your seed, 10 litres per tonne or whatever the rate is of seed. Um, but you can do it yourself. And I'm tell I always tell people how they can do it themselves. The sort of minerals, um, micronized calcium, like micronized guano, for example, really, really good as a seed treatment, really big uh, response on early root growth. Uh, so calcium and phosphorus together in that form of micronized guano. Manganese, they call it the seed energizer, probably the most important of all trace minerals is to have some manganese there on that seed and zinc comes a reasonably close second. And as I said, I like some boron at that time and I'll talk about boron a little later if we get a chance. So a manganese, of course, killed the organisms that make manganese available, killed by glyphosate. So it's something to be aware of and zinc in broadacre uh, soils uh, basically can be one of the most cost effective things in zinc seed treatment because uh, zinc again is required to make oxins that determine leaf size. So a zinc deficiency will be a smaller solar panel. That's what a leaf is, a solar panel capturing sunlight, water and CO2 and making the stuff that makes you money, which is called the building block of everything, glucose. So zinc is massively important. And if you're deficient, you can't afford to address it. Just that little bit of zinc on the seed for the investment can be the biggest cost to benefit ratio of anything you do in Broadacre if you're zinc deficient, because it will make a difference to the size of that leaf and the yield potential associated with having a larger solar panel. 
So calcium and, and, and phosphate, we sell in Canada a product called Nutrifos Superactive, which is this five micron, very, very, very fine guano calcium and phosphate powder that's a wonderful seed treatment. Or you can buy Seed Start, which is available in your country, a uh, couple of, you know, really inexpensive, but again, it's got all of those things I just described. You can make it yourself or you can buy it basically. So liquid injection, we'll talk about for a moment is the concept of squirting a little bit of nutrition uh, right in, you know, just knifing it in behind the seed uh, or with the seed across the seed bed. Uh, and basically there's a bunch of things happening there. You know, you've got something called imbibition, which is the seed sucking up moisture and germinating much more rapidly. Well, that happens with liquid inject. So that's a nice little outcome. You know, you might have treated, you might have soaked seeds and then planted them and noticed the difference. Uh, and, you know, you can do that in your garden and so forth that people often do, but you get a more vigorous and an earlier germination from what's called imbibition. But then that also gives you an opportunity to do things like a microbial inoculum along with a few, you know, like you might put a bit of that micronized uh, guano in there and that liquid inject, really good thing to include. You might put a little bit of manganese, a little bit of zinc in the liquid inject, uh, a little bit of fulvic to collate the manganese and zinc. And then, you know, this very easy to brew blend that we call BAM, beneficial anaerobic microbes. I would have some of that in as the micros behind the minerals in liquid inject because it's really good for sparking a vigorous early root growth. It's, it's used all over for that purpose and it's really inexpensive if you grow it yourself. So that's another option. And that's what I'm talking about on that slide, just a few dollars to uh, liquid inject, you know, that mixture. And I've given a liquid inject, a sort of kind of thing that I would use, but a liquid inject formula. Um, and so you've got it there. So you can see that and you can have the notes, but it's two or three kilos of that micronized guano powder. 300 grams of soluble kelp powder, which we call tri-kelp. It's three kelps on one, which outperforms any single kelp. There's kind of synergy there between those three kelps. 200 grams of soluble fulvic acid powder, kilogram of manganese sulfate, kilogram of zinc sulfate, 550 mils, sorry, of triacontinol, um, <clears throat> which is this very, very powerful plant growth promoter. Um, and then 10 litres water, 10 litres of, of beneficial anaerobes, which is, you know, just... Again, really inexpensive if you've brewed it, brewed it yourself. And it depends on what, what water rate you can afford to put out, but that's based on sort of a 20 litre per hectare water rate and liquid injection, really, really good effect. So just touching on boron, I think we're getting close to, we've only got five, five minutes left till we start the question time. So I'll just get as much done as I can, but basically notoriously lacking in huge number of soils. Most, we need a part, one part per million minimum on a soil test. Most, most broad acre soils have got 0 0.2, 0 0.3, 0 0.5, uh, so it re what, what, is it, what can it offer in Broadacre? Well, basically you need it there from the start. That's why you want to, might want to put some in liquid inject or you might want to use a boron humate granule where the boron is tied into the humic acid. The humic acid combined with the DAP can still be combined, create that phosphate humate, but deliver boron into that root zone with those little granules right from the start. That's what we get good results with. Um, so basically... A boron dramatically inhibits root uh, deficiency, inhibits root root elongation because basically boron is used for cell division. So you don't get that early root growth that you're chasing. Uh, so people always know about boron for pollination, but now we're saying you need it at the start in broad acre and it's usually missing. Now it increases the uptake. There are several studies on this and the availability of other nutrients and PK are all affected by boron in terms of their utilization and uptake, zinc, iron, copper, and calcium. That's a pretty big package. NPK, zinc, iron, copper, and calcium. Research demonstrating the boron deficiency, those minerals won't be uptaken as, and utilized as well. So good reason to address it earlier on. Boron assures less empty grains. So you know the story of empty grains and, and less sterility of wheat seeds. And legume crops, it's absolutely essential component of, for nitrogen fixation. And so you need that pink, you can see on the bottom corner, squeezing those nodules, having that pinkish red, uh, it's a sign of boron and often a molybdenum deficiency and no nitrogen fixation if it's not pink inside. Uh, and then there's another nitrogen hit with boron. We talk about uh, nitrates needing to be converted to to protein, which is what we want them. And that's an enzyme called the nitrate reductase enzyme that's driven by molybdenum and boron. So yet another role to get high protein, which is what drives plant immunity and it drives human and animal, animal immunity. We need to have protein, not be eating nitrates. So uh, it impacts photosynthesis. Um, and finally, 
it means lower levels of vitamin C and glutathione. Basically what happens in a boron deficiency is that you create this excess of a couple of what normally are good antioxidants called, uh, what are they called, caffeic and chlorogenic acid. Uh, you get this over, that goes into the top part, makes the plant brittle and creates that sort of dieback response that happens from a boron deficiency. And basically the plant then starts pumping out huge amounts of antioxidants to neutralize the free radical damage associated with this excess, this imbalance of what would normally be good now is too much of it and now it's bad. And so you suck up all the vitamin C and really important nutrient called glutathione, most important nutrient for liver health. So you didn't produce, I mean, food, let your food be your medicine, your medicine be, be, be your food was the statement of the founder of modern medicine. And you've got no medicine, medicine in that food because vitamin C and glutathione are two important components that won't be there if you're boron deficient. So fix it. Uh, of course, they also, both of those things are impacted in plant immunity as well. And you've got less of them. So you're not going to have as much immune capacity. You're going to need more chemical intervention if you're not understanding these processes. So as I mentioned, stabilized boron granules is what we use here um, as, as a, to start off that crop, give it some boron and to create the other benefits of having or a humic acid next to that DAP, MAP, or even guano. And I like to see a 50-50, I like to see some DAP, MAP, some guano granules together, 50-50, with the soluble, soluble boron granules in there. And you've got that nice little package of calcium and phosphate, the boron, the humic acid to, to stabilize the phosphate uh, and create that magnifying effect, that phosphate humate that we're looking for in that instance. So um, I think probably... What, what do you guys want to do at this point? Because I've, I've done my hour and a half. Did you want to move on to questions? I, I, I can probably flick through to um, the question. There were some of the questions you had asked that I think are coming up next on these slides. So I, shall I jump through to there at this point? Sure, yeah. Um, I think the only other thing that I think that would be great to talk about would be kind of the over-yielding effect of cocktail cover crops on humus building and then go okay. on to the questions. Okay, I'll do that. Well, I think it's included in this little segment. So I'll just do a little bit about how do you build humus and understanding the importance of building humus in the context of, well, our largest bank, the National Bank said, okay, everyone wants to get bigger or get out. It's the dominant mantra in agriculture. We've got people constantly wanting to borrow money to buy their neighbor's farm to get more efficient and get larger. And we have a set of criteria to see if you qualify for that loan. So we tick all the boxes, yes. And they give you the loan and then too many, there's too high a percentage of those loans that are falling over because the guy wasn't successful or the woman or whatever wasn't successful in that new operation. So something's wrong with our set of criteria. Let's study and redefine what determines profitability in agriculture. So on 800 farms in one region of New South Wales for three years, they looked at everything. Is it the size of your tractor? Is it the amount of MPK? Is it your marketing skills? And to the surprise of everyone, it was the percentage of organic matter that determines your profitability. That's how important it is. And of course, it also will determine if, the more, if you can build organic matter, you are directly stepping into the carbon cycle and sequestering what otherwise would have been in the atmosphere. And it's the biggest strategy in terms of countering climate change. So let's look at 10 humus building hints. Uh, don't burn down your cover crop. Now, if you've gone to the effort of doing a cover crop with all the benefits of a cover crop, and then you say, well, I'm just gonna burn it off now. Basically, it's not. there's a couple of problems there. You're not going to convert that carbon into humus. It's going to go up as CO2. But there are three minerals that have a cycle. Carbon, the carbon cycle, the nitrogen cycle, and the sulfur cycle. So all three of those minerals, when you burn them off, off gas into the atmosphere, and you didn't get them in the soil where all three minerals are most certainly required, particularly carbon and sulfur. But even the nitrogen, you want to hold it in the soil and keep it stable. And that won't happen if you burn it off with a, with a herbicide. So that's why... No-till is perhaps, you know, minimum till is perhaps better than no-till. We need a little bit of a horizon, top three or four inches where we get some soil contact and we break down that cover crop if that's our aim. Putting legumes, so you guys know this probably better than most countries in the world, is the, the concept you're doing, you know, that's sort of inter, intercropping concept. You know, you've led the world in that field and I applaud you for it because it's some wonderful work. Um, but the, even just a simple concept, putting a low-growing clover underneath a cereal crop and the benefits that they can offer uh, is it, it, a wonderful little package of benefits. But we'll just touch upon the cocktail cover crop concept. Uh, you know, it's great. I'm a great fan of the, of the Brazilian scientist, uh, Dr. Adamir Caligari, and he was a man that spent his, most of his professional life working on um, basically cover crops and, and how they work best. And he was the guy that came up with this recognition that if you combine five families together, 
grasses, cereals, brassicas, legumes, and it's pronounced some say chenopods, some say chenopods, but those five, so chenopods is, is the one that's missing. There's plenty of blends that have got four of those five families. Chenopods are a small group. There's everything in the beet family, so sugar beet qualifies, but there's a the beet family, it's quinoa, it's amaranth, and it's spinach, that's it. It's a very small group of plants. There are some weeds that are, that are amaranth, so that could be part of your, you only need 1% of your total blend minimum. Sometimes I usually put 2% in there to make sure I'm gonna get 1% germinate of that kinopod component. But the finding is that only when you include the five, this is, this is Adamir Caligari's finding, um, and it was quantified. He didn't, he didn't really explain what was happening. He just said, you've got a great response. And so the US Ag Department went out and did some research. They said, why are we seeing the equivalent of four cover crops in one cover cropping cycle? You can push a penetrable to the end of the soil when it used to stop six inches down with a hard pan after one four month cover cropping cycle, if you've included the five families and you don't see that normally. Why is it like you've done three or four cover crops on that paddock in one season? So they went out to check. And what they found was only when the five families are present, the plant roots begin messaging each other and those plant roots begin pouring out substances called phenolic compounds and really significant amounts of these substances into the soil. Now, that's what we drink green tea for because the antioxidants in green tea affect every one of our 10 trillion cells beneficially, while all of the single cell or multi cell organisms in the soil, it turns out, respond to this outpouring of antioxidants in the form of phenolic compounds and they go into hyperdrive and hence the big changes you see in a short time. It's a wonderful, wonderful finding, um, this concept of five families and what's called a cocktail cover crop. We're more likely to see a photo like that one on the bottom left hand corner from our growers in 59 countries than the photo of their crop. They're more excited now about their cover crop than their main crop because they know they're going to see this wonderful change at the end of that cover cropping cycle. So. Um, the first question I got here was what nutrient helps with herbicide metabolism? Okay, so the, the well, it's, it's not so much that the additive rather than nutrient, well, it is a nutrient, but fulvic acid is the big one. Fulvic acid is genuinely acidic, so that's good. Um, the finding when we talk about um, everything having a sweet spot, the finding with glyphosate specifically, because that's the world's most widely used herbicide, is that its sweet spot is 2.9. Now, no one knew that. Everyone knew you chucked in a bit of ammonium sulfate and dropped it below five. But the sweet spot is 2.9. If you can drop it with citric acid down to that, or, or phosphoric acid, or whatever you want, the citric is actually the best. You drop it down to 2.9, you know, it's a significant reduction in the amount you need, which is a good start. And then the additive that, that basically improves its uptake and utilization. So you're using pH to improve its, up, its utilization, but then you, you add fulvic acid to that mix. Uh, and fulvic acid, you know, basically it, it, it's got a CC of 1400, it's absorbed, the glyphosate that's taken, your fulvic acid increases cell sensitization, you get a better, a better kill, and now it's still tied to the fulvic, and that fast tracks the biodegradation of the herbicide because bacteria which biodegrade the herbicide love fulvic acid. So they come like bees to a honeypot as the principle of using fulvic acid with your herbicide. I sort of mentioned that a little earlier. Yeah. Um, I think they were thinking more along the lines, are there any nutrients, let's say phosphate or manganese that might help also the plant to overcome that kind of shock that it has after the herbicide application? Well, yeah, I mean, in that instance, you could use, um, you could use phosphoric acid um, just for the role of phosphate, which is a hugely important role within the plant. Um, a little bit of phosphoric acid as the, as the tool to drop that pH down to 2.9, and then you're getting a double effect with all the benefits of that soluble phosphate. And you, and you might put a little bit of fulvic in there again to create that um, stabilizing or, or that, that, that more buffered response to the, to the fulvic. But to the phosphoric acid so that's one option but you know knowing that what you're doing with the glyphosate this is one other sort of what what in nutrition farming we it's very much a pragmatic approach there's no oh you can't do this you can't do that you can't do this saying okay we're doing these things how can we do it better how we can do it more sustainably uh, and ideally if we can drop them and we can move you know to this sort of chemical chemical free model which is certainly what i'm doing on my own farms well that's good you know you get high premiums that's good you're doing it you know basically i see uh, I see farming as the greatest profession. There's nothing like it. Food production is the most important single profession. And basically the guys that are doing it well without the crutches, the chemicals are just crutches. 
it's because you haven't mastered your profession. And so I see the guys that have mastered their profession, they are not the guys that do half the yields and so forth, because there's no reason for doing half the yield in organics. If you master it, you can do the same yields um, and you can have higher quality and you can have less pest and disease pressure. But the guys that actually mastered that are the masters of the most important profession. You know, they've discovered how to do it. And they're heroes that should be on the front page of every magazine, in my opinion because this is the most important profession. You're the master of that. You should be revered by everyone around you, in my, con in my, in my opinion. Uh, that's just my feeling about that, uh, that story. Sorry, I don't think I answered the question. What was the question again? No, it's all good. I think we'll move on to the next one. Yeah. Um, I have a couple of questions around humic acid. Uh, one of them is, uh, how does humic acid pr promote fungal growth? Um, and a lot of the conventional soils that are tested around here, are usually like a 10 to one bacteria to fungal ratio. What is the ideal ratio? The ideal ratio, is the, the ideal ratio. So, so say that you would invest in a little micro biometer. Remember, I haven't got one here that I can show you, but a little micro biometer. So what you're doing with a micro biometer is so you're taking a little powder, a pouch full of powder, and you're adding it with a little, a little mechanical stirrer, the, the little uh, battery powered little stirrer, dissolving it in a, in a test tube. Then you're taking some soil, you're sieving it, you're putting it in there, you're, you're mixing it up with that same little stirrer, and then you leave it sitting for 10 minutes. Then you get the microbiometer app on your phone and it comes up and you say what the block is and you say what the, what, what the, what the, whatever you want to have stored because it's stored in the system on the cloud. Um, and then a light comes out of the camera, out of your camera. So you're looking, you've taken, you, now you've taken 10 minutes after leaving it sitting there, mixing the, the solution, mixing. It's basically the powder, the solution is encapsulating the bacteria, the fungi, the protozoa and so forth. Uh, and you take a, a three little drops and put it on a card and now you've got the card in your camera and it says too close, too far, and then click. You get a total a bacterial biomass, or microbial biomass, not bacteria, total microbial biomass, and there's a score. You want to be above 400. If you're 200, you're in trouble and you're going to be doing bad. The best soils on the planet, and I've traveled a lot, remember, uh, in many, many countries, the best soils without exception are those with the highest reading on a microbiometer. But then... Just like you could walk out a few years back and hop in your Tesla and suddenly you could go 20% faster and you didn't have to send it back in. They just changed the program. Well, they changed the program that you, you, you could be picking up on the app. They changed the app. So now you've got fungi to bacteria ratio. And that's just of such value. And what you're aiming for, you know, understand that, 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 that uh, cereal crops and legume crops, for that matter, are bacterial dominated. That just means you want to have like, say, uh, 55% to 45%. That's the kind of thing that we're looking for. 55% bacteria, 45% fungi. That's the kind of ratio. It's just bacteria dominates just a bit more bacteria than fungi in the equation. As you say, it's usually 10 to 1. But knowing that you're on the right track, spending a couple hundred dollars, buying one of these little meters, you can test it yourself anytime and you can see what works and what doesn't. And you'll see how good cocktail cover crops in terms of changing are in terms of changing that fungi to bacteria ratio. That's the key. That's the big Profit determining sustainability equation is improving your fungi to bacteria ratio and broad acre and 10 to 1 is pathetic and you need to change that and you'll see all of the benefits kick in once you start building that fungal component. And that little meter lets you do that and it's so simple and so easy to use 10 minutes and you've got an answer. Um, yeah, another one on humic acid. In a dry land situation, would 5 to 10 litres per acre be enough to treat salinity areas like high yes. salinity areas yes it would be uh, that's what we use um that's about the amounts that are used and that is the figure that's that that does it um but i mean we're we're talking about fertigation so i'm not sure what we're talking about in your situation but they're fertigating quite regularly so it's not just one dose of that it's going through on a regular basis sort of thing so uh, you know what you're doing a broad acre basically is trying to affect salinity in the root zone because that's all you can afford to do and even the presence of those soluble humate granules at planting are going to have some impact on that front and then, you, then theoretically if you had a big issue you might go through boom spraying uh, on the soil we're talking uh, humic acid the do-it-yourself humic acid model so it's cost effective um, to try and counter that because you haven't got fertigation where you can just put it through the fertigation sort of thing yeah, we did that on our own farm and it took about three years along there. We have some salinity spots or alkalinity spots that come up along railroad tracks. 
Okay. And it took about three years of applying about three to five pounds an acre in furrow and then yeah. spraying it again with about five to 10 liters in the fall uh, okay. over those same spots. And then now we're up to about a 50% crop from nothing growing there before. Oh, that's nice. Yeah. And, and that's just the limitations of, you know, if you've got fertigation, you just go bang, 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 and just fertigate it every few weeks and you can do it, change it much more quickly. But you've got the limitations of dry land scenarios. And it's interesting to hear that time frame. That was sort of what I would expect. So that's good to see. That's great. And it'll keep improving. If you keep doing that, it'll keep improving. Your 50% will become 60 and so forth. But that's a nice mm -hmm. story. Thanks for sharing that. Um, and then on seed dressings, I have someone asking... Basically, along the lines, what would be the best if you had to choose between humic acid, fulvic acid, and kelp to put on your seed? What would be your choice, and how much would you put on? Okay, so um, of, of, of everything, I mean, they're, they're all, I would put a little bit of all of them, but if, if you had to choose one, it would be kelp. Definitely it would be kelp. And if you're using um, our tri kelp soluble powder, um, Gee, I'd have to think back to that because it's because it's all built into formulas and things. Um, it's 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 really quite small amounts. You know, you might be using if you were using ten liters of of the of the liquid kelp per ton, which is the kind of rate that you would use. So per ton of say so, so and the liquid kelp would involve uh, say twenty percent powder in it, ideally. So so there's two hundred grams per liter, so it's ten. 10 twos, so, uh, so two kgs, two kgs, but that might be too much. I'll have to think. Oh, sorry, I can't really answer that. I'll have to go back and work that out. But it's two kgs per per uh, ton of seed. But I'm thinking one kg would probably do the job. Um, mm -hmm. But but two kgs is the top end. So it's between one and two kilograms of, of the soluble powder converted to liquid and then put on at 10 liters per ton. Is is what we're talking. Um, going into foliars. Uh, we have a question on the big four. So in, especially here in central Manitoba, we have a lot of heavy clay soils with high magnesium. What's the best way of delivering the big four if we're not in the luxury zones? Is it foliar? And can calcium be mixed together with other nutrients? No. Um, okay, there's a couple of good questions there. Uh, calcium in the form of, if, so if we're talking about liquid inject, so what, can you give me some kind of concept of what percentage of people have got liquid liquid inject facilities? I would say below 20%. Ah, oh, so it's only one in five. Mm -hmm. Okay, so, so the liquid inject doesn't lend itself, well, for the one in five that do, um, you know, like for, for, a start, for a start, you could have some micronized guano powder in that liquid inject, which is a really good additive for liquid inject. So that gives you, um, two of the big four gives you calcium and phosphorus and then you could have some some humic acid and boron in there as well so now you've got three of them a um, little bit harder um, with well what well, depends I mean what, what your levels of magnesium are in your soil anyway but again you can do micronized magnesium you can do magnesium sulfate there's a few options there the, the advantage of using the micronized options for in that super fine powder with the guano and phosphorus, the calcium and phosphorus together is that they're compatible. Whereas calcium nitrates, you pretty much, you can't put it with anything phosphate because that makes an insoluble calcium phosphate and you can't put it with sulfate based minerals because that creates calcium sulfate, for example, which is uh, insoluble. So calcium nitrate is quite limited in terms of what you can combine it with. So normally you're going to do it by itself with, you know, whatever. Some, some forms of kelp are compatible with calcium and so forth, but you're not going to be able to add trace minerals or phosphate to it. You've already got calcium and nitrogen together, uh, but that's your limitation. So it's quite an issue there. Mm. Yeah. So so basically, um, you know, you're going to do your boron before flowering. It is most important point to make sure with the foliage spray. And the kind of rates would be one kilo of soluble per hectare, whatever that comes back to, probably a pound per acre or a little more than a pound per acre before flowering. Always with some humic acid. You could put fulvic with it. It's a foliar, but the humic is cheaper. And it's compatible because it's sodium borate is quite alkaline, so it's compatible with humic acid. So you might as well use the cheaper one and get that um, that greater in that third third better uptake of the boron. And any boron that hits the soil will be in the form of a boron humate that won't leach. So it's quite quite good from that perspective. So um, you know, 
if you were magnesium deficient on a leaf test and magnesium sulfate, never use it in the soil. It's a waste of space. It's, it's how you get rid of magnesium in the soil. It's the most leachable form of magnesium. But magnesium sulfate is cheap. It's 50 cents a kilo. And uh, you can put out, you know, five, six, seven, eight kilos, that kind of rate per hectare, whatever that comes back to, eight pound or slightly more per acre um, of magnesium sulfate to address and lift magnesium. Always put fulvic acid, always this two to 300 grams of fulvic acid to get this better uptake and to create the collated magnesium, to create the magnesium fulvate, it's called, when you mix the two together. But so you're going to use magnesium sulfate to, to lift the magnesium if that was one of your limitations. Um, and we talked about boron and how you would do the boron sort of thing. And we talked about calcium nitrate perhaps as a foliar, but you couldn't put it with magnesium sulfate. So you've got to do them separately. It's a bit of an issue. Or you do, the cal you do the calcium and phosphorus together in your liquid inject to get a, a lift in those two. So that's a couple of su suggestions there. Mm. Any other uh, questions? Yeah, I got lots coming okay, in just, here. Just keep um, them coming. Yeah. Concerning boron applications, what form of boron would you want to add in the seed row? And what would be your maximum rates in order to not worry about boron toxicity? And the same question for for uh, the foliar form of, of boron and rate and any experience with using boron as a desiccant. One yes. to two pounds would kill a crop, then supply supply the soil for next year, question mark. Or would you worry about it leaching over winter? Um, not if you put humic acid with it. That's, again, uh, that's the benefit is of, of stabilizing and creating that very stable boron humate. They bond together and they lock together, and so you don't leach them over winter. Um, I haven't had experience with them. Um, I know that it's possible because, of course, you can, you can, you can kill a crop with boron if you put too much on. Um, there's a few things. If you're doing soil applications, basically with boron, um, calcium and the calcium levels in your soil has a huge impact on its toxicity. So the maximum, now we're talking borax in the soil, which is 11.2% boron. Um, you can use 15 kilos. Sorry, I'm talking kilos, but this is what we talk over here. Uh, 15 kilos in a low calcium soil is absolute max. 15 kilos per hectare. So that's a broadcast application rate is 15 kilos. And that can be, and so you might put it out with lime or something, but that can be um, go to 25 kilograms in a soil that's got good levels of calcium. So the calcium levels affect the toxicity of boron. Now, if you're going to use, be using boron as a poly spray, it's just one kilo per hectare and sometimes lower, but that's the maximum rate is one kilo per hectare, which is you know a pound per acre or something, somewhere around there, slightly more than a pound per acre, in the form of soluble, which is sodium borate, which is the soluble with 21% boron. It's the most concentrated form of boron. You could use boric acid, you can't really use borax because it's not very soluble. Um, you've got to have hot water handy to dissolve it and so forth. But boric acid, much more user-friendly, is 17% boron um, or, or sodium borate, which is 21% boron. And what we usually use is the sodium borate here at one kilo per hectare as a foliar spray as the, as the rule of thumb. Now, if you're liquid injecting, again, you don't want to uh, overdo the amount that you're going to put in the soil, but you can put more in the soil than you do on the leaf. And you might use a couple of kilos of soluble or three litres of boric acid, those kind of rates. And this is per hectare uh, as a liquid inject. Thanks. Thank you very much. Um, I have a question on uh, BAM. So yes. I think a lot of people heard about it on the podcast. And yeah. There's a couple of questions. How often do you have to apply biology for disease control? Because they're assuming that it's more preventative than a fungicide would be. And then how do you multiply it well on farm and what is the benefit? I guess that's kind of explained in the podcast. And also you had mentioned milk powder being extremely beneficial when using BAM as a foliar. Just well, that that was specific. Over. That was specific. So we, the good thing about this large apple, which has been, has been um, you know, I see every disease and every problem as an opportunity because it's like, okay, how can we see what we can solve with this? Now, one thing we struggle with there is you don't have that issue there, but we've had this fruit fly issue. No one's ever seen anything like it before. It's obviously a climate change. All the guys spraying the chemicals couldn't manage it. We had... Um, you know, a couple of periods where we we basically we had monitoring traps and we missed. I had an agronomist leave and we had this 
gap we're no one was there and we had you know a big fruit fly attack so there's been all sorts of issues but we had powdery mildew which i didn't even know was a major issue for apples i'd done a bit of apple nutrition but it wasn't my specialty and you know can drop the leaves on an apple tree and it spreads over the whole tree and so forth so we've never had a complete success we can hold powdery mildew and you know cucurbits or whatever crop in variants so it doesn't get worse but we can't actually beat it we've never with with, with non-fungicide options so i said okay let's do some trial work on nine uh, you know proper control areas with 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 controls and replicates and so forth and see if anything works and they've been this research out of brazil with the use of powdered milk well actually it was with ordinary milk it was, and then initially people said oh that's only because you know raw milk is so much better nutritionally than pasteurized milk and they did use just raw milk and it outperformed three fungicides for powdery mildew. It was really effective. Then they said, okay, well, let's try pasteurized milk, did the same thing. Let's try uh, full fats milk powder, did the same. Let's try low fat milk powder, did the same. So they don't even quite know. I mean, it could well be the calcium with all the cofactors, because of course, in nature and in food, that's why food's called medicine, it's not just calcium. Calcium will have the boron and the other things that increase calcium uptake present in every food that has calcium in it because that's the deal. It's called cofactors that are always present. So it could be that, but, but this might be something else, but this might be an amino acid or whatever. It might even be the stimulatory effect of, of, of milk on lactobacillus, which are on every plant leaf anyway. And that's what BAM is effectively. I mean, it's got a whole range of other fun, beneficial fungi, nitrogen-fixing organisms, and these things called purple non-sulfur bacteria, which can fix nitrogen. But it has multiple strains of lactobacillus. So that's what's in our gut. That's what's in our skin. It's in every animal gut. It's on every leaf surface. It's in every soil. And it was only the Japanese Professor Higa who, who developed EM, who said, well, why is it there? Why is it everywhere in huge numbers? And then discovered that these beneficial organisms, beneficial anaerobes, we always think about beneficial aerobes, they can be just as effective. They can protect from disease. They can fix nitrogen. They can deliver minerals to the crop and so forth. And that's when he then developed that concept. And BAM is just a basically kind of extension of this few new organisms thrown into that mix. And it's so easy to brew on farm. It's just literally, we use 100 litres of the mother culture and we put 50 litres of molasses. And you, you know, in your cold conditions, you probably need to have some heaters around the outside of the tank to, to warm it slightly. We just put it in the sun. Um, and it takes, over here in summer, it takes about 10 days. And you use pH as the guideline. When it hits 3.5, um, it's an anaerobic scenario. It's just a 1,000 litre tank with a hole drilled on the top with a garden hose coming out of that hole. And the garden hose goes through into the tank in the airspace at the top, so you haven't got the 1,000 litre tank filled quite to the top. So it's just an airspace because it's there to capture the CO2 produced by the organisms as they multiply and start pumping out CO2. And you need an escape valve for that CO2, otherwise the tank will start swelling and the whole thing backfires. So that, that hose then goes to a bottle of Coke, a, a full, full bottle of Coke, uh, not Coke, but water in a Coke bottle or a, a soft drink bottle that's strapped with plastic ties onto the side of your thousand litre tank and the hose goes into that and it bubbles as the CO2 comes out of that cavity and goes through the hose, it bubbles. But, and you can use that when it stops bubbling, the job's done, it's finished, it's multiplying, but we just use pH and it takes about 10 days, the pH is down to 3.5, that means the lactobacillus have spewed out sufficient lactic, there's so many of them, they've created enough lactic acid to drop the pH down and then the job's done and you've got this wonderful thing. And I mean, it's, it's, a, it's a really amazing seed treatment. It's, a, it's like a fertilizer response. You can just put on some pasture and watch what happens. It's just this incredibly do it, cheap do-it-yourself fertilizer that also, if you're going to put anything, cow nitrate, anything at all, you put a bit of that behind it and get this increased uptake that comes uh, with putting the microbes behind the minerals. So, and, and, it, and it controls disease. I mean, we've used it. But what it, in the case of the milk story, well, amongst those trials, um, one of them was just milk and BAM. And of course, BAM, the lactobacillus love milk. And so they just go ballistic when you put the milk powder. Milk powder does it by itself. But when you combine the two, like next day, there's no powdery mildew. 12 hours, nothing. And so we did the whole orchard and, and we had one more bout. We had perfect conditions for it. Bang, we just corrected it. So now we've got a cure for powdery mildew. And we also found that bacillus subtilis, which you can brew, and trichoderma, which you can brew, they, those combine, we actually put them in with the milk powder because you can combine them all together. Um, that works as well. They were the two out of the nine that worked and they both worked equally well. So, But the finding with the milk powder in New Zealand is that, um, that the, the melon industry in New Zealand adopted it last year. 
um, to see if it could control the major disease that they have, which is powdery mildew. And not only did it completely control powdery mildew, but they got a really substantial increase in bricks, increase in flavour and increase in yield. So obviously you're delivering a whole bunch of good things, including a lot of calcium with all of its cofactors to create that response. So it's a pretty good outcome and it's five bucks a kilo, so it's pretty cheap. You know, we're using 1,500 litres of water and that involves, there's, there's uh, seven or eight litres of milk in a pa equivalent and a kilo of powder milk, of milk powder. So it's quite a lot. And so, you know, to the kind of rates that work, we're using like five, four and a half kilos per hectare of milk with 1,500 litres of water, but you'd be pulling it right back to sort of half a kilo in broad acre, that kind of rate. So it's really, really inexpensive. It's really worth considering. Even just as a calcium fertiliser, it's a great concept. Oh, Any other questions? Yeah. Um, yeah. Um, you know, sort of the, let's see. Uh, will mycorrhizal inoculants from other countries work in Canada? Are the, are the species of mycorrhizal different here than they would be in other no, countries? No, no, it's a good question. I mean, there are some native variants, but generally speaking, like the glomella strains, which are the creatures, the most dominant forms that create glomalin, they're called the glomellus uh, strains. They're they, they, they are present in every soil on the planet and that's usually usually what's used in inoculums so we've we we're in 59 countries we have not found a country yet uh, where platform doesn't work sort of thing so you know it's a, they're basically a bunch of unit most of the inoculums are universal organisms that are present in every soil so you're okay all right um yeah then i had someone ask the link between soil plant and human health if there was a quick way of summarizing that. Well, I mean, the very, the, the very simple story is that you are what you eat and what you eat comes from the soil and the soil is not what it used to be. I mean, if you understand the simple concept that there were 74 minerals in the first cell that oozed from the Precambrian motion and in the perfect blueprint called nature, which is what it is, there are no accidents. If there were 74 minerals, then we actually need 74 minerals. And, and every year now we're discovering, oh my goodness, strontium and chromium, they're doing something. They found three rare earth minerals and I'd, I've never even heard of them before, uh, that they're doing trial work in the University of Western Australia on seed treatment. They're saying, oh my God, look at this. And this is like, we didn't even, 74 minerals required. That's why kelp has got such value or fish, ocean fish, because it contains those minerals. And so for decades, we, well, basically we had a German chemist, Justice von Liebig, who, you know, if you burn 100 kilos of crop matter, you've got five kilos of ash. And that ash is predominantly the minerals that grew that crop. And so he, he ashed some plant matter and with the crude technology 10 or so decades back, he said, well, look, mostly that ash is NP and K. And so we can, we can uh, fire up some of these dormant armaments factories. We can make these NPK fertilizers and we can, we can really simplify, you know, you can just put it on from a bag. You don't have to do all the things we always did with animal manures and spelling paddocks and cover crops was just part of agriculture. Now we can put it on from a bag. So what we did was dumb down nutrition. You know, 74 minerals were there uh, and we were sort of recycling them all with the manures and the cover cropping and things. Now we're just taking a little bit of everything with every crop and putting three things back. And a little bit later, we started adding some CalMag and sulfur, but we mined our soils for, for many, many. And it was only 15 years into that experiment, and I call it an experiment because it was, uh, that we started to see this massive increase in pest and disease pressure. And rather than saying, is that linked to the dumbing down of the nutrition, which of course it was, that's how it works, uh, we said, oh, science can solve this we'll bring in the rescue chemicals and so that was started seeing the invention of these chemicals which we've used more and more of every year for 10 decades every year increase 14.7 percent increase last year 14.4 14.1 13.9 13.6 every year more but wait for it every year without exception more global pest and disease pressure that's actually the definition we call it a hiding to nothing in Australia. It's the definition of unsustainable. More and more for less and less response, you can't keep doing it. So we need to be looking at other solutions. And that's what the regenerative revolution is about. So, okay. And now we find it in our kids. We see 1,400 school kids, 13, 13 chemicals tested, couldn't find a child that didn't have a buildup of those chemicals. So if we can do it better, we need to be looking at that. And there's no sacrifice. It's the win, ultimate win-win scenario. If you can master this thing, you make more, you have better yield with less chemical costs. 
uh, and you're producing better food and the food determines the people. You know, we are what we eat and, and that whole spectrum. You see, see, the minerals are the starting point for everything, the whole spectrum of minerals. And that's where kelp comes in because it brings in a whole lot of other minerals. But minerals are the building blocks for all of the things that are protective in the plant, all the things we now know as what are called phytochemicals, the, the antioxidants, well, the phytonutrients they're called, the sulforaphane and, bro um, and, and brassicas, the anthocyanins and blueberries, all of those things, the level of those is how you grew that. They just did this trial work in the UK. I was sponsored by five universities for my last UK tour. And they shared this research where they looked at oranges in the UK and they found a significant percentage of oranges that had zero vitamin C. You think, I had orange juice, I got plenty of vitamin No, you didn't. It depends on how that crop was grown. If you didn't have copper, zinc, a couple of other cofactors, and you know, particularly if you shut them down with too much NP and K, and boron's a big story in there as well for vitamin C. And if you don't get enough boron because you shut it down because nitrogen and potassium both shut down boron and you had the imbalance wrong, then you, you've got, you actually got no vitamin C in what you thought would have vitamin C. So it's how you grow stuff. That's why we call it nutrition farming. It's how you grow it that determines whether you're feeding your kids and the people buying your produce with decent food that is medicinal and that will help them live a longer, happier life. I think that's a great spot to end off there because we Thanks. just five minutes over our time, which is perfect. Um, no, I really want to thank you, Graham, because without pioneers like you, I don't think there would be as much change going on in the world. And I think this movement owes a lot to people like you and the Gary Zimmers and Gabe Browns of this world. Um, and for all of the uh, people who listened in, we actually recorded this. Um, so it'll be available on the Covers & Co. YouTube channel. Um, and if you have any questions, don't hesitate to reach out to myself, Regen Egg Solutions, Egg Solutions, or Covers and Co. And some of the questions that we can't answer, we can always relay them over to Australia. Um, and and the, basically, I, Amy, my PA, will make sure that if you want that, um, the, the, um, the, those presentations, because there's a few slides we didn't get to. Uh, so you've got some notes and so forth that we can make them available. We can send them to you or whatever, and you could ship them out from there. That would be much appreciated. No, thank you very much again, Graham. No, Have no, a great no. morning. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Hopefully the apple harvest keeps going well. Yeah, I hope so. And you guys get out of your drought just as fast as we do. Yeah, fingers crossed. Great all talking right. to you. You Best too. of luck. I hope you all have a good season, you guys. And it sounds like you're going to have plenty of sunbathing, if nothing else. <laughs> <laughs> For sure. All right. <laughs> okay, we'll see you all later.